inviting me for the second time in this uh, nice international master class. I'll try to do my best uh, just to elaborate on the, although uh, in laparoscopic uh, work is minimally invasive from the patient and the surgical point of view, it has potential problem from the anesthetic view and fully understanding between the surgeon and anesthetist, what are the pathophysiological change during insufflation of carbon dioxide under pressure into the abdomen. And again, I'm going to highlight what are the extra problem when you're facing with morbidly obese patient because everything will be much worse physiologically um, during surgery. And anesthetist has to be well trained in order to have a safe journey and a good outcome for the patient. So we're going to talk about uh, laparoscopy and the difference between a steep Trendelenburg-like major uh, uh, gynecological work or reverse Trendelenburg, for example, for example, lab colleagues and bariatric surgery. So, and we'll talk about what are these characters of carbon dioxide and how we monitor it in order to uh, alleviate the toxic effect of this substance. Right. So we'll talk about, uh, sorry. Um, the hemodynamic changes are severe change of hemodynamics. Um, there is a lot of innervation of the parasympathetic system into whether you your scope near the viscera in the upper part near near the uh, the stomach and uh, or near the adenexia and the uterus and ovaries, you can give get severe bradycardia to the extent it can cause cardiac arrest. So fully alert anesthetist was monitoring of the usual ECG, blood pressure, saturation, carbon dioxide, because you have to stop surgery momentarily until this is corrected. It does happen, and if it passes unnoticed, it can cause very severe uh, problem to the recovery of this patient. Unconcealed blood loss, you have to be alert about, because the surgeon is busy, with the surgical uh, field, uh, but you can have concealed hemorrhage. You have to be on alert for this. And the gas embolism luckily doesn't happen often, but if it is picked up early, you get a good outcome. Late picking up of gas embolism can be really fatal. Right, so CA2 is pushed under pressure into the peritoneal cavity liters and liters, especially longer procedure. And uh, an aesthetic uh, and ventilation technique uh, can help most of the time yes. to, um, to, to, to remove the, the hypercarb. Because the effect, if you leave it for long, it can actually cause uh, some acidosis and metabolic problems. Um, when you put patient in a Trendelenburg head down, there is no space for spontaneous breathing because the, the diaphragm is pushed up and patient cannot left under anesthesia with ventilating spontaneous. The, the, the ventilation has to be controlled and full muscle relaxation is used because the surgeon need full relaxation for have a, a nice cavity in order to operate safely. And the anesthetist has to understand full relaxation is absolute essential during laparoscopic work. We continuously absorb C2. Pneumothorax, it does happen. And we pick it up in the monitor by rise of the peak, sudden rise of the peak in respiratory pressure 
And if you suspect it, you have to react swiftly and you ask your colleague, a surgeon, to stop and deflate the abdomen because you have to interact and, and uh, drain that pneumothorax. Right. Now, pathophysiological effect of C2, as we said, it can cause hypercarbia, lead to tachycardia and increase the myocardial oxygen consumption. It, uh, it is a mechanical, uh, endocrinologically, it increases the noradrenaline output and that increases the systemic vascular resistance, lead to a decrease in cardiac output. It is well tolerated in the majority as uh, other speakers uh, spoke about it. It is well tolerated in fit patient, but if you have a patient with ischemic heart disease, compromised uh, cardiopulmonary disease, it is a skill you have to compromise between the C2 insufflation and the cardiovascular system. And we have uh, sophisticated monitors in order to pick up early change and in order to interfere. So the anesthetist like to have the minimum C2 insufflation, surgeon like more insufflation to see better. And the compromise is the answer, especially when you have a critical patient. A lot of patients with cardiovascular disease can be done safely, provided you are vigilant and know what you're doing. And I'll show you some example uh, later on. Um, you get, uh, during laparoscopic surgery, due to compression of the renal uh, uh, vessels, you get compromised renal output, but the, the, the kidney is still perfuse. And when you release the pressure from the abdomen, the urine output usually returns to normal. As long as you maintain the mean arterial pressure, the kidney is no good output, but the kidney is perfused and well preserved, provided you have a good control of the mean arterial pressure. So one of the major organ which is affected by the is a distension of the abdomen by pneumoproteinem is of course the lung. As the pressure increases, in the normal intra-abdominal pressure in a supine patient is slim, zero plus or minus one. In obese patient, this can go up to between five to seven centimeter of water before you do anything. Imagine now you put liters and liters under pressure in the abdomen in order to visualize the organ and have a cavity for the camera to work, that put a lot of uh, compromise into the pulmonary system. That's why control of ventilation, knowing the mechanics of ventilation, how to compromise between the pressure in the abdomen and the pressure in the lung in order to have effective pulmonary ventilation for a safe outcome. And uh, laparoscopic need full understanding from the anesthetic part in order to have a safe journey. So when the anesthetist is in difficulty, always don't hesitate to ask the surgeon, please drop the pressure. And that's good communication between colleagues is vitally important. There's no, uh, there is no joy that having a good feel with a high pressure in the abdomen and you, you end up with pulmonary complication. Um, reverse Trendelenburg head up tilt. Ventilation is better. However, the cardiovascular, that's a big difference. Hemodynamic, because a lot of the blood and the vascular volume pooling into the lower uh, part of the body and legs and if the patient is fluid is deficient, you get catastrophic drop of blood pressure. That's why the advice here is to give time before you set the patient up for laparoscopic cholecystectomy or bariatric to give an intravenous loading of fluid that will avoid 
the major problem with the uh, head up tilt before the C2 insufflate. If you already compromise this lady, you have a very low blood pressure and uh, major con consequence of this. Just a word about thromboembolic disease. The laparoscopic work, especially um, uh, because you compromise the uh, vena cava, you comp by nature, when you put the pressure in the abdomen by insufflation, you compromise the venous return through the pooling of blood in the legs, and that invite venous thrombosis, especially in obese patient. Patient with pulmonary disease, usually they are a bit hypoxic and they have, according um, physiologically, they compensate by polycythemia and high hemoglobin. And uh, somebody's taking picture now, I can see red lines. Um, uh, and uh, you get uh, venous, uh, so you get more thromboembolic disease. People in cardiac failure are more susceptible to pulmonary disease, even with minor surgery. And by nature, any surgical intervention increase of fibrinolytic, decrease of fibrinolytic activity means there is risk of uh, venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Um, sorry. Went to, to the next slide. Listen, why the slide is not moving now? Sir, you click. Ah, yes. Here, here we are. Now, so the advice that has been studied several times in surgical journal that uh, extended thromboflexes is vitally important uh, post-operative period and the surgeon looking after this, they write at least a good to two, three weeks. It depends on the, the complexity of the surgery. So for bariatric surgery, usually two to three weeks of uh, uh, post-operative venous, uh, we start a pre-operative as well one dose before the operation and give three weeks of um, an oxyparin in order to protect against uh, thromboflexes, uh, uh, against venous thrombosis. A word about long haul flight for non-emergent uh, surgery. Uh, surgery really has to be delayed after long haul flights because um, sitting on a chair in an aeroplane for eight to ten hours and you, a week later having surgery, you're inviting for problems with pulmonary embolism, it can be fatal. Even if you give uh, 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 thromboprophylaxis therapy, so it is avoid unnecessarily non-urgent case until the effect of long haul flight is is finished. So in, in conclusion, although from this uh, few slides, although laparoscopic surgery is minimally invasive from the surgical point of view and patient point of view, physiologically, it is not minimally at all. So anesthetist has to be alert about this. Right, a, a little bit, um, about uh, obesity, because obesity worldwide on the increase in the third part, uh, third world, and in the modern uh, European and American, it is on the increase everywhere. So anything I talked about in the compromised cardiovascular respiratory change during laparoscopic uh, work, it is made more, much more worse when you are talking about morbid obese patients. So the vigilance of monitoring, um, is, and in long cases, invasive monitoring of arterial line and doing blood gases is important and essential for safe conduct of surgery and anesthesia. So. Uh, this is a tip with his permission. This chap with the, me and Mr. Khan uh, did him a few years ago. Although the patient had, may have, and this patient was only 36, morbid disease coming for bariatric surgery. And he was crying if we leave, he was a 
approaching pulmonary end stage disease with a compromise of um, of his uh, pulmonary circulation, and uh, he was only thirty six, and there was about uh, if I if I show you this clip for about ten seconds, you see can, things can be done, but with cooperation between surgeon and the surgeon. I hope you see this uh, video. He's, he, we did him a few years ago. You can see he's blue, very difficult sleep apnea. Cannot. This video was taken an hour before he came up to theater. He cannot keep, keep asleep. Severe pulmonary high pre, um, uh, compromise, and we managed to anesthetize him safely. Yes, he gave us problem kept in the intensive care for a few days. However, he recovered and, uh, and uh, went to home safely. So, right. Right, in, in obese patient, this slide, I hope I can explain. The top part on the left-hand side, that's a normal patient. When you are obese on line supine, even before anesthetic, the middle part of the graph, you can see the patient, this uh, pyramid thing, breathing, up, going into the function residual capacity, it means any slight problem lying flat. If you see morbid obese lying flat, you look at the monitor, sitting up in a saturation 95, 97, lying flat, it goes to 90 in no time. That's even before you give any anesthetic. And when they anesthetize and uh, lying down, especially gyne, they really, the breathing through the residual volume, this means the closing patient breathing under the closing volume means there is no chance he can maintain oxygenation unless you actually physically relax them fully and ventilate them. And you have to expand the lung after you sit them up in a what you call it, beach chair position before we extubate them and control the airway. So it is a technique you have to master during anesthesia, how to safely anesthetize them and how to bring them round. In obesity, there are two parts of the, of the on the left-hand side, you can see more, more than 30% are sleep apnea and they may have hypoxia, hypercapnia like this, a chap we saw in the video clip going into pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. So he was going that way. On the top of that, there is increase on the right hand side of the screen, increased blood volume and usually their blood volume, the normal average 70 kilogram man having a blood volume of five liter, it can be double in obese patient. That put a lot of strain on the heart and left ventricle, and you can have left ventricle as well as right ventricular, and in the end stage patient die from post biventricular failure. And to catch like this chap to do bariatric surgery to save his life, he's only said this, he was going to die, the, the physician told him, you're going to die maybe in 10, 15 years at age of prematurely, uh, at age of 50, by doing successful bariatric surgery, as we did with this chap as an example, they can get to a normal life. Um, so, but it is needs a lot of effort and help from, um, uh, especially post-operative care. Not majority of the patient they go back to the normal world. Only three to five percent of patient with severe problem they need high dependency or intensive care for a day or two in order to optimize their circulation and pulmonary mechanics to have it, to send them safely back to the world and home eventually. So obesity, as you know, is inviting you to have a lot of uh, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, intracranial hypertension as well. A lot of problem, increase of cancer, a lot of sleep apnea, and so forth. Sleep apnea is, it, it, in the past, say 30 years ago, very rare patient going to CPAP machine. 
Now we, as an it is, it is a big enemy to us of obstructive sleep apnea. And all modern, uh, modern uh, <clears throat> anesthetic and uh, looking after this patient has been improved a lot since if you suspect the patient is very sleepy, snores and cannot sleep well and in the morning very sleepy, he send them for a respiratory physician to do a sleep study. And if positive, then you put them on CPAP machine for minimum of three months before they come to surgery. Then you have a good outcome. Take it haphazardly and uh, <clears throat> And not uh, to, and if patient we think he's not co uh, compliant with the CPAP machine, I said sorry, you haven't been using the machine as we instructed. Go back and use your machine, and then come back for a safe surgery and anesthesia. It has made a lot of uh, a lot of uh, improvement of the outcome. It has been studied. Uh, especially the American by echocardiogram, putting do echo on this sleep, severe sleep apnea and see the cardiac uh, right heart, left heart are compromised. Three months after use of CPAP, redo the echocardiography, marked improvement. And that's why they behave like any normal patient. And once their weight is lost, they don't need the CPAP after, say, a few months from surgery. When they lose massive amount of weight, the, the, the requirement of CPAP is finished. That's why we encourage them to use the CPAP and you lose weight, you get rid of this machine. So can you see the benefit here of improve the cardiac status, improve their heart failure, reduce pulmonary hypertension. It's all bonus point to improve the outcome from surgery. Even if the patient don't come for surgery, it prolongs their life. So CPAP is now very common in, in obese and sleep apnea. It, it just improves their style of life, whether they need surgery or not. Now, Cardiac failure is very tricky in obese patients because a lot of obese patients, because of the mere heavy body weight on the chest and, and, and uh, abdomen, if, if they can't breathe, they are out of breath quickly. And the, when you evaluate them preoperatively in the preoperative assessment, is it just the orthopnea or the or the limited exercise due to their obesity or something else, which usually the heart and lung. And if you suspect it, we, there is a nice uh, paper, well uh, documented most of the lectures, the, the circulation 09, that's how we, this graph picked up from this paper, how we evaluate uh, patient with compromised uh, cardiac system. So it's a very low risk one, no problem, we just use the standard blood and ECG. If they are, have got pulmonary uh, problem on the top of their hypertension, they will do a chest X-ray if they are severe pulmonary uh, disease. We look at the uh, X-ray and see, it, has it got signs of pulmonary hypertension? If true, we do a blood gas, and convinces the respiratory people to look at them. That is only 5% of the patient. If the lung is excluded, then we look at the heart. Have you got a hidden ischemic heart disease or heart failure? And then we send them for sophisticated echo and MUGA imaging technique in order to find this patient's got a ischemic, hidden ischemic heart disease because the good e example of the ischemic heart disease is obese. He cannot go around. He cannot do exercise on prone because of severe obesity. Talking about patient with BMI of 50, 60, huge patient. Then we ask our cardiac colleague to evaluate them and if necessarily consider angio and rectify their coronaries to have a good outcome. This is about only three to 
percent of the patient, luckily. So you got to evaluate your patient very well in order to have a good outcome. I'm sure most of the surgeons are aware about this paper done by De Maria, who was the first, he's a surgeon, evaluated, I think in this paper, about 270 patients to identify what risk stratification you tell the patient in bypass surgery. And what they found in this interesting, simple, interesting paper, really, the following five factors, each factor, BMI above 50, male gender, hypertensive, age above 45, and uh, any previous history of thromboembolism or pulmonary hypertension or sleep apnea. So each of these five factors carry a score of one. And what they, they, they summarize it in this table, if you have a score of zero to one, your mortality is about 0.2%. That's two in a, in, in a thousand. And uh, if you have a, a score between two to three, you have a mortality of 1.1, 1, .1, 1 in a hundred. And if you have a score up to five, four to five, the mortality increased by 12 folds. 2.4, that is nearly two and a half in a hundred. So between group A to group C, they, it is about mathematically 12 folds. And patient has to be giving a realistic, uh, realistic, that's why we say realistic uh, mortality because a lot of uh, what is the risk and you have to be objective about it. And that is one of the only paper which give some insight into the risk with bariatric surgery. And as we know, male are more risky than female. And in this paper, the main cause of mortality, we look at this table, apart from GIT, GI, GI bleeding, you can see one of the main ones, embolism, pulmonary failure, and cardiac events and the sudden death. Yes, the number are small, but it gives you an insight how to select your patient from. That's the value of preoperative assessment. And surgeon has to pick up the, the problem patient, send a trust colleague in the preoperative clinic for anesthetic to look which one will pull through, which one can cause problem. Right. That's how we position patient in the reverse uh, Trendelenburg for bariatric surgery. Rhabdomyolysis. This is again <clears throat> uh, been um, mainly for people, um, although many surgeons may not have seen it, but it is a real problem for Morbid, it was done by Brodisky in Stanford University in California because they do a lot of much bigger patients than you can ever imagine. Talk about BMI 70 and 80. So very heavy patient. And uh, they found the interesting factor about this rapture miles, which can be fatal. Patient are severely overweight. Pressure in the abdomen above 20, because imagine you have uh, this mega, mega patient and you want to, to see what you are doing. You put pressure more and sufflet gas you to more. So if the pressure is above 20 and they are mega obese and prolonged surge, this is a three fatal complication. Usually obese patient, pressure above 20 in the abdomen by the insufflation and prolonged procedure, usually teaching, this, this experienced surgeon teaching uh, the younger surgeon and take longer and longer and the end up with this. It's usually get tea color urine at the end. If you pick it up early, you can avoid fatality by this measure of increased fluid, force of diuresis and large volume of fluid and you give them a bicarbonate in order to 
neutralize this uh, myoglobinuria. But it can end up with very easily in, in renal failure and poorer outcome. So if you have mega obese patient, try to shorten the operation and not to raise the unnecessary increase of the pressure in the abdomen. Prolonged case of five, six, seven hours can be fatal in this. Right, analgesia, a word about analgesia before I finish. We usually PCA only for open procedure. We used to use it a lot when we open the abdomen, but nowadays with minimally invasive surgery, laparoscopic, hardly we use this patient controlled analgesia. No epidural, epidural has no place in laparoscopic work. People have to show muscle anesthesis, to show muscles and see how good he is. He can, in a 60 BMI patient, put an epidural. is not fun. It takes a long time and does not work and it's not needed. So um, we stopped this practice for a long, long time. We rely on intravenous, but a small and simple analgesia oral usually is more than sufficient with non steroid Plus, Local anesthetic infiltration, including intraperitoneal uh, weak local anesthetic. So we usually put a quarter percent uh, bupivacaine or chirocaine, uh, 40 mils intraperitoneal. That will remove this shoulder, uh, uh, Imran was talking about shoulder pain, putting local anesthetic into the abdomen. Uh, at the end of the procedure and completely deflate the CO2, the shoulder pain is gone in 95% of the patient. So, the, and it is not, it sounds big amount, but it's not toxic. The absorption of local anesthetic in the abdomen is very slow. So on the top of that, you put infiltration on the trocar side. This is, helps the speedy recovery and reduce the amount of morphine consumption. Um, one of the post-operative TTOs to take away home the patient, usually because of the cutting of the stomach and things, he needs things to heal. So we give them uh, PPI, uh, glanzoprazole, parastamol, codeine, and the extended, as we said before, of uh, prophylaxis of uh, at least two to four weeks. In conclusion here, um, it is a challenging field for anesthetic and surgeon. Full understanding between the surgeon and the anesthetist and the whole theater team, and especially in the recovery room by the nurses, fully understanding of the pathophysiology and dynamics of the pneumoproteinium is essential for the safe outcome. You have to, um, a lot of people mentioned Imran and Mr. Khan about equipment, right equipment for the surgeon and right equipment for the anesthetist. Monitoring is absolutely fundamental. And the teamwork, cooperation between everyone from putting the patient to sleep until safely uh, revive them at the end, end and send them to recovery safely before they go to the war. Thank you for your attention and I'm um, open for any outside the abdomen in laparoscopy. So coming on to the trocar first, the trocars are of different types, both in disposable and reusable um, uh, trocars. This is called the safety trocar. You can see there is a safety wall over it and a sharp edge inside it. When uh, you go in by putting it inside the port, by clockwise and anti-clockwise motion, and you enter into the abdomen through this sharp end, and once you enter into the abdomen, it comes out. So it saves the viscera's from getting damaged. So it is called the safety trocar. There are other types of trocar as well, like uh, this one. This has an end which is called pyramid end. It looks like a pyramid. The superiority of this trocar is that when you go in, cutting in the abdominal wall, it gives more space and it splits the muscles well. Then there is another type of trocar. 
which usually is available in, in the disposable ports, it is called opti port or optical port. Because when you put the camera telescope inside it, you can visualize it on the screen. Everything, every layer you can visualize. Mm -hmm. so, so this is all about trocars. Now coming on to the cannula. The cannula has, has different components and different companies promoted in different manner. You can see small holes over here. When you go in the, uh, basically uh, the carbon dioxide gas, which is used for insufflation goes in and there is another hole over the trocar and you, hit, you hear a hissing sound that you are inside the abdominal cavity, right? When you are putting the second or third trocar. So it has a shaft and there is a wall over here through which you can attach the gas through the pipe, right? And you can switch it and switch off from here. Then you can, if you open this trocar, you can see a safety valve over here as well. This is a valve which should be working well. So it's when uh, you start the procedure, it doesn't leaks. Okay, like this. Then there is a plastic type of uh, sleeve over here, which you, which should be very good. It should not be cut. It should not be torn because if there is um, uh, low pressure in the abdomen, it will be very difficult to operate. Can come to me after that. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Sir, excellent. We are thank you very much. So, coming on to another disposable trocar, this is a five millimeter trocar. The mechanism is same. It has also got a safety valve, a shaft. It can be opened as well. A valve inside, flap type valve, right? And it has got a valve here to control the gas pressure. There are also three mm trocars and they are smaller in length and they are usually used in the pediatric surgery. Usual length of this trocar is 15 centimeters, but there are long length trocars as well, which we use in the bariatric procedures and in the super obese patients and other laparoscopic to an a trocar, which is a bladeless trocar and it is 11 mm and some companies make it 10 mm. Okay. It has also got a cannula, which I told you that it is a pyramided shape cannula. It has also got a shaft and you can see the ridges over it, right here. This is a very good trocar, but when you go in and rotate it clockwise and anti-clockwise and you go in, it doesn't allow uh, very easily to come uh, trocar to come out when you are taking out the camera or taking out the instruments. On the other hand, if you use this trocar, which doesn't have these ridges, it can come out with the uh, uh, pull of the instrument. So you have to be careful and you have to, uh, you know, be static or hold this uh, trocar otherwise. So this trocar also has a, uh, a shaft and there is a valve as well to control the gas which is attached over here. And there is there are different types of uh, mechanisms in this um, cannula. There's a mechanism of pushing down the button and rotating it to open it up. And here you can see a valve. Again, a valve is here, <clears throat> which stops the carbon dioxide to uh, goes out, uh, come out from here. And here you can see another safety valve from which you can go in. Okay, coming on to another trocar. This is a same disposable trocar. The superiority of this trocar is that it is an it is a optical trocar, optiport. So you can put the camera in, the telescope in, and you can see the uh, muscles and different layers of the abdomen being cut. The rest of the mechanism is exactly the same. So in the disposable ones, there are also trocars which are five millimeter and they have almost the same mechanism and it is a pyramidal shape trocar tip. The port's cannula is uh, having ridges and it is 
5 mm in diameter and about 13 to 15 centimeters in length in different uh, companies make different lengths. <clears throat> there is a valve as well, and you can see the entry point as well. So if you are using a reusable tow car, the thing is that you can put a 10 mm instrument inside like this. You're putting a 10 millimeter instrument inside. But if you have to put a five millimeter, any instrument of five millimeter, and if you go inside it, it would leak, right? So you have to have something which helps you to use the five millimeter instrument because as you, as we all know that the usual instruments in laparoscopy are five millimeter instruments, especially in the basic laparoscopy. So this is called the reducer or sleeve. You put it in like this, put a finger over it so it doesn't leak and you can very easily put the five mm instrument inside like this. Okay, so this is a journal brief description about the ports. So I am repeating that they're the most commonly used instruments in the basic laparoscopy are 10 or 11 mm ports uh, and 5 mm ports in general surgery and in most of the gynecological and urological surgeries. And the other trocar which are being used in uh, ports and the uh, mm ports are also used uh, in the pediatric surgery patients. So th th there are a few more instruments which are related to this. This is the Veriz needle. This is a special type of needle which gives you an access to the uh, abdominal cavity. So when you will be studying access, it will be uh, told in uh, more detail. Um, for now, it has got a blunt end. When you go in, it automatically uh, saves the you know, it has a sharp end. If you can see, when it, you go in, this blunt end will come out. And you will attach a gas or a pipe over it, right? So this is an important instrument. Now coming on to the other laparoscopic instruments which we usually use in the basic laparoscopy. So as we... Most of us know, because all of us are surgeons, uh, that this is an important instrument. What is this instrument called? It is called endodissect. This is an endodissector. You can see the tip of it. It is just like an artery forcep angulated in front. It is also called Maryland, right? It has got a shaft handle. And here you there is a um, revolving, reticulating uh, type of thing from which we can rotate it, right? This is a knob for the rotation. Here you can see an, a thing which is metallic and you can attach the cautery over it like this. So can you, you can use it during surgery if you require any coagulation. The other important instruments are endograspers. So the endograspers are of different types. Uh, they can be atraumatic endograspers like Babcock's. They can be traumatic endograspers to have a big uh, bite and uh, strong grip, uh, grip. They can be single action endograspers like Johans. They can be double action endograspers. And there are some other specialized type of uh, endograspers. I'll give you a brief account upon the endograspers with locks and without locks. In this uh, laparoscopic instruments, also there are reusable instruments which you can sterilize and they can be at the same time disposable instruments which you can use in, in a case and you can just throw them away. So here you can see this is a grasper which is a double action grasper and it is an atraumatic grasper, right? And it is having no lock over it. There is no lock, okay? And I'll show you the lock or the ratchet, what it is meant and what is for what, uh, for what it is used. 
So you can easily, uh, you know, hold the bowel during the appendicectomy uh, or any other procedure, intra-abdominal during laparoscopy. It has also got um, the area to be attached with the cautery and there is a handle and a knob to rotate it. Now I will show you a disposable trocar with a lock. Here you can see there is a lock. It, it is a grasper which has got ridges and it, it will be able to hold the uh, visa well, like in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, sometimes you need a uh, uh, sometimes you need a grasper uh, if, the, if the it is so inflamed or there is empyema that it should hold it well, and it has a lock as well. And if it is locked, you you can see it cannot be opened until and unless you unlock it, right? This is an other grasper without a lock, and you can see it is called a babcock. It has exactly the same um, shape as the open babcock has. You can see it is a double action one. It is also used to usually uh, grasp the bowel. It has also a rotating uh, knob, and you can also apply a cautery over here if required. So this is an other uh, a grasper uh, with a very sharp edge to hold instruments, uh, to hold uh, viscerals or take some small biopsies, right? Tightly. It is also without lock. This is an other instrument with lock having double action, right? Okay, this is an endo -seizer. You can see the shape of the Caesar. The Caesar also have different shapes at the tip. Some are curved, some are straight, right? This is a reusable instrument. This is a disposable instrument. Both have rotating heads, right? And both have cautery places to be attached. Basically, it is used for cutting the, uh, for example, the cystic duct or any other uh, viscera like the base of the appendix, or it can be used in the bowel as well. Now, this is an other important uh, instrument, which is called L hook. Okay. You see there is a tip, L type tip over it. You can use it for cautery, cautery, and it has an end over here where you can attach the lead for of the cautery. You, you you have used must have used this in the laparoscopic cholecystectomy and it can be used in almost all the um, surg laparoscopic surgeries. Okay. This is an other important instrument. Okay. It's it is a extractor. It is 10 mm instrument. Usually we, we have seen it using uh, extracting the gallbladder, right? It has also a rotating shaft and a knob to rotate it, and it can be locked as well. Sometimes some companies make it, makes it which is not of lock, but most of the people use it locked ones. And it is usually called crocodile. You know, it opens its mouth like a crocodile. See? Okay. Now, this is another important instrument which is usually used in advanced laparoscopy because in basic laparoscopy, you, don't, you are not so good at uh, the intracorporeal sushing and knotting. This is uh, a needle holder, endo needle holder. You can see it is there of different types, right? This is the shaft, this is the lock, and you can unlock it by pressing it like this. So you mount a needle over it and start sushing. There are some companies which are making the autocorrect type of um, needle holders in which you just hold the needle, it will autocorrect and will be in a straight line. Okay, now this is a grasper, uh, punch biopsy forceps. Laparoscopically, if you want to have a biopsy, you can just hold it and pull it, right? Here you can see another instrument, which is aspiration needle. 
uh, when you have a very tense uh, gallbladder like empyema or it has thick walls and fully filled or the stone is impacted at the uh, neck of the gallbladder, you usually put this aspiration needle in with much safety and then you attach it to the suction and you suck it out, the bile or the uh, pus inside the empyema gallbladder. Okay. This is another instrument just like uh, L hook, but it is called spatula. It has got a flatter end like you see, and you can attach this to the cautery. So it is used in the liver bed or at places where you want to have a cautery with a blunt end. This is a very important instrument. This is called the no. knot pusher, right? You see, there is a hole inside it. Usually the extra corporeal knots which are tied and put inside, for example, if you are tying the base of the um, appendix, right? You uh, put in the, um, that uh, basically extra corporeal knot and pass it through it. And then you, when you will push it, the knot will go in. So it is the knot pusher. So this is a brief description of some of the important instruments we are using in laparoscopy. Then there, basic laparoscopy. Then there are a few things which I want to tell you. This is a telescope, which, which is a zero degree telescope and 10 mm in diameter. There is, a, uh, I will tell you in more detail in when I'll be telling you about the lab stack. This is a 30 degree telescope and 10 millimeters. And this is a five degree telescope, uh, five mm telescope with zero degree. Right? So these are some more important instruments usually used in uh, advanced laparoscopy, but these days they are used in um, basic laparoscopy as well. For example, this is a Ligashore. Ligashore is an advanced bipolar uh, technology uh, gadget, which we use uh, ligating the vessels and cutting them. So it has got a shaft. It is attached to the Ligashore base unit. And this has got a shaft and it, the length of this shaft is 37 centimeters and diameter is 5 mm. But we can also have this Liga Shore in 10 mm and 37 centimeters. And it has got a Maryland tip, endodisect tip. This is the specialty of this one, but it has also got a dolphin tip as well. From here, we can rotate it. This is the rotating knob from when we press it like this it starts coagulation at the tip and there is a special sound when it comes, the cycle is complete, we leave it and we cut it from this cutting knob. So this is uh, Liga Shore and you will learn it more in the energy devices. So this is also important instruments disposable. This is a tacker, which is used in the uh, hernias, right? This is an other tacker which use, is also used in usually ventral hernia. This is an absorbable tacker. The previous one was a metallic um, uh, tacker. Okay, so you can have a roticulating type of man maneuverability with it up to almost 120 degrees because um, it is difficult in the ventral hernias to tack with the interior abdominal wall. So here you can see with the abdominal wall, the uh, it will be less difficulty when it can be rotated like this. So this is, this is, here you can see a clip applicator, which we usually use uh, to clipping, while clipping the um, Lega clips at the cystic duct or cystic artery. You can see it, it has got a, here you can put the Liga clips in, okay? And you just push it and the Liga clip is closed. It, this is a shaft of the, um, uh, you can see the shaft of the instrument and this is the knob where you can rotate it. Here, okay? this is the handle for pressing it. Okay, and other important instrument is, a very important instrument rather, is the suction and irrigation. So it has got a shaft. This is a five mm suction irrigation system. It has got a shaft 
it has got a handle and th there is a knob which if you go up it will do suction and if you go down it will do irrigation and you can attach two uh, janker suctions or pipes over here one will be attached to the suction and the other one will be attached to the irrigation and if during uh, you know suction we know that if the some stones or something gets stuck there is a knob which you can unlock and you can just wash it from here right and you should be knowing it by yourself more than the technician On, only then being surgeon you can you know instruct people what to do okay so this is another knob if it doesn't get settled it get, just gets open from here and you can take this thing out and you can wash it as well so it was a brief description about the ports and about uh, the uh, ports and the uh, basic laparoscopic instruments. The basic laparoscopic instruments usually are 35 to 37 centimeter in length and in bariatrics and are the in the obese patients we use instruments which are around 43 to 45 centimeters in length. And the mostly used instruments are five or 10 millimeter, but in pediatric surgery, three millimeter instruments are also used. So if there is any question regarding the instruments or the graspers or anything, you can please ask. Can Thank you hear me? You. Thanks, Tansir. That's great. Uh, I think the best thing is if you want to do the next one on the stack and then yeah. we open questions for both of them together. Should okay. we do that? Right, right. Yes, sir. We should do that. First of all, we'll do the patient positioning. Then we'll go for the lab stack. Dr. Tansir, excellent, yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Thank you. in okay. detail, in detail, this was a presentation and excellent presentation, especially instruments. And you have talked in detail, excellent. Thank you very much. And so, I think I, think uh, I like your style this time of doing it uh, virtually with, with everything in front of yeah, you. This is not yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I would have made a PowerPoint presentation. But uh, I thought it better to uh, show the instruments live and discuss it uh, and make it a bit of uh, interactive one so that people can see the instruments and we can talk in detail at the end of this lecture. So um, now we will be going towards the uh, uh, patient positioning in laparoscopic surgery. The uh, positioning usually has all the same terminologies like the um, like in the open surgery. So the best position and the most commonly used position in uh, laparoscopy is supine position. The most important thing is that uh, when you uh, are considering the supine position, you should where to put the arms and what to do. So there are two ways of putting the arms. I will demonstrate on the um, patient as well. But if you will put arms like this and they are above 90 degrees and the procedure is like long enough one and one and a half hour it will cause brachial plexus injury so you have to be very careful so either you will place the arms up to 90 degree or less than 90 degree during the procedure and it is better to tuck in that arm at least which is towards the side of the surgeon and if possible tuck in the both arms i'll show you how to tuck in the both arms it will give you more space on both sides and your assistant and the all team will be very easy to perform that procedure. So first of all, we thanks the, uh, our colleague who has um, volunteered to be a patient. So uh, now this is uh, basically a supine position. And as you can see, you can give a panoramic view. Uh, you can go back and give a panoramic view. So this is a supine position. Patient is lying flat on the bed. His arms are you know, wide apart on the armrest and they are almost at 90 degrees. Okay, so this pillow has been put to give comfort to the patient, different anesthetists and this different uh, doctors do differently. They, they put a, a head ring um, beneath the uh, head as well. Okay, so, uh, the other side uh, way is to put the arm inside and tuck in the arm. And we can do it on one side and we can do on both sides. So in this way, you get 
better position and more space for the surgeon and for the assistant to assist. Okay, so this is a belt which is used for the safety of the patient. It is usually tied at the level of the pelvis, interior alex spine area, but you can also tie it just two inch below the knees. And you can tie it in at both ends in different procedures. Here you can see the padded foot support. This, you can show it from here, the padded foot support. This is very important if you are doing a reverse Tendenberg procedure, like in bariatric surgery, this would be of great need. Okay, so what we do, is we lie the patient and use a uh, position is called the trendinal burst procedure for them. Here you can see, go up, give a panoramic view, go back and you can see, you can, let's see, you can tilt the patient to 15 to 30 degrees, 35 degrees in this, uh, in this procedure, uh, in this position, trendinal representation. And this position, if I give an example, is usually used in laparoscopic appendicectomy or laparoscopic gynecological procedures where you work in the pelvis more, so you want the vistas to go back. So uh, if we want to do a laparoscopic appendicectomy, we give a right up as well, right up. Right up, please. This is right up. Okay, that's it. So now, straight the patient. Lock the bell. Okay, we are flattening the table. The other position we are going to narrate is the reverse trendinal revival position, head up. So this procedure, uh, this position is usually used in laparoscopic polycystectomy, laparoscopic bariatric procedures. And you can do a write up as well, write up, which is usually used, head up and write up is usually used in laparoscopic polycystectomy procedures. Okay, then you can again flatten the bed. So there is an other procedure uh, position which we usually use. Position this is called the lateral position, which we use in uh, nephrectomies and the So in this procedure, we make the patient at a side and make him comfortable by putting the like this and we apply the belt again for safety like this Now, if you can break the table for some time. Break the table. So in this procedure, uh, come over here. We are breaking the table in between so that the kidneys become more prominent, that's it. Okay, you can just straighten up the uh, patient. Okay, thank you. Just turn around. So the, another important position is called the French position. So there are two types of surgeons. Some surgeons want to do the surgery standing on the right or left of the patient. And th then there are surgeons who want to perform surgery by standing between the legs. And if the uh, surgeon is standing between the legs, this is called French position. Some surgeons do even polycystectomy in this position, 
but the most of the bariatric surgeons uh, they use this French position to do the laparoscopy. Okay, in this this foot is very uh, padded foot uh, support is very important. Apply the uh, belts. Dr. Tansi, really excellent. Excellent. And just we can imagine we are with you in your operation room. And Thank also, you. this is appreciatable. So, your operation uh, room is full equipped. Yeah. This is one of the here. best hospitals. Yeah, yeah. Room. One of the best hospitals, no doubt. And uh, so, it is. So, the head end is up. This is the reverse standard bird position. And you can see that we can. Uh, fix this, these legs and tie these legs over here to give more comfort to the patient and we usually do it in the bariatric procedures and we perform the surgery standing right here. Between the legs, especially, okay, I'll do it, I have to hold my right or you have the right hand, not the Okay, now, there are some kind of uh, head walkers kind of thing, reverse So we are now doing the reverse standard bird procedure uh, position and in gynecological procedures and if we are performing uh, interior resection or APR, so we have to make a lithotomy position as well during in laparoscopy as well. Lap assisted or total laparoscopic uh, procedures uh, attach the poles. So we will quickly attach the poles So we are making a lithotomy position while performing laparoscopy. Okay, if you are uh, doing right hemi left hemicolectomy, or if you are performing APR laparoscopically, you stand at the right end of the patient. Okay, and you have to make a lithotomy position in some cases. And if you are performing a laparoscopic hysterectomy, usually you stand on the left side of the patient and you have to have a, a with a manipulator vaginal manipulator uterine manipulator put in through the uh, vagina and you have to make a, a thought position so here we will put the patient in the thought position and we perform the laparoscopy here and we will detach these um, uh, uh, these parts of the table and we can do a lithotomy position. So we will be free. It's okay. It's okay. Just, just arise them. You can put them back and we can go up. Okay. Remove these lithotomy poles. Now I will uh, quickly give you an account of where to stand, where will the surgeon stand during these procedures. So these were the different table positions and in the lithotomy position you have to have a bit of trendular bird position that means 15 to 35 degrees head down. Okay. In the laparoscopic polycystectomy, the surgeon usually stands on the left side and the laparoscope is in front of the surgeon usually. Um, and the assistant, uh, the cameraman stands on the left of the surgeon and the assistant stands, one assistant stands in the front of the surgeon as cab nurse on the opposite side of the surgeon. While you are performing laparoscopic appendicectomy, usually the surgeon stands on the left of the patient. Um, you put in the ports and the cameraman st stands on the right of the surgeon holding the camera and one assistant or the scrub nurse stands on the opposite side of the uh, patient. 
Right. And uh, if you are performing a laparoscopic hysterectomy or ovarian hysterectomy, uh, the surgeon stands on the left side of the patient and put the port in. The uh, cameraman stands on the right of the uh, surgeon and the assistant stands on the left, right side of the patient. So these are a few um, important procedures which you perform every day. So you should be knowing it. The, another important procedure is laparoscopic inguinal hernia. In the inguinal hernia, if you are performing the right inguinal hernia, the patient, the um, surgeon should stand on the left side of the patient and you, you put the <coughs> port in, three ports in and the, your assistant will be on your right side which will be holding the camera, the second assistant will be on the right of the patient. And if you are performing a left uh, hernia repair, laparoscopically, then you have to be on the right side of the patient to perform it on the left side. Then the cameraman will be holding the camera on your left side and the other person will be, uh, assistant will be on the left of the patient. So I am giving a brief account of different positions in the routine procedures which we are performing. So in the advanced procedures, there are different things. For example, the bariatric, you are standing in the, in between the legs, the cameraman on the right, the person who is detecting the liver on the right of the patient, and your first assist, uh, assistant will be on the left of the patient. This is how it goes. And same in the case with the uh, colorectal cases and upper GI cases, different techniques. So this is a brief account of, of the patient positioning, and we can discuss it at the end of the uh, discussion, uh, a few question answers. Now I will try to uh, share our uh, presentation. Just give me a while. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Yeah, you can share. So can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Can see it. We can see the screen as well. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I'm telling you how to assemble and how to uh, troubleshoot the lab okay, stand. Just a while. Coming on to the. Uh, can you hear the sound? Yeah, as well, we can hear. Yeah, it was good. Okay. Tansir, it stopped moving. Yeah, Dr. Tansir, it's not working now. Uh, just a while. I... I think it will work in a while. Can you? So this is a lap tower on a lap stack. Here you can see this is a screen or the monitor. Here you can see the insulator. This is light source, and this is the camera CCU or the camera unit. So there are different components. One is called the imaging component, which includes the monitor, the light source, and the CCU. And the other one is the insulator and the carbon dioxide cylinder, which we can see here. So what we do is we, we have got uh, this system, which is called the insufflator on the top always. Initially, when we started laparoscopy, we used to think that camera should be at top. But why this should be at top? Because when you are operating, you always ask, what is the gas pressure? If it is at top, you can see yourself. But if it is down there, you have to, you know, hang up and see what is going on there. So this is uh, the, uh, basically the uh, insufflator, which puts in the carbon dioxide into the patient. First, we will discuss about the imaging system. Imaging system consists of a um, monitor and we attach our camera head. This is the camera head. Here you can see, this is the camera head. Can you give me the telescope, please? 10 degree, 10 mm telescope. This is a 10 millimeter telescope, 
with a zero degree angle. Here we attach the telescope and we attach the light source exactly over here. And we attach the other end of the light source with a knob over here. Here you can see the shaft of the telescope. Here is the place to attach the telescope, uh, the camera, um, the light source. And here the telescope is attached with this knob. In this telescope, there are different components. Here you can see, here, right here, that you can zoom in and zoom out with this knob. This is for fine tuning of the image, right? So if you can see here in my hand, you can see that I can do a good fine tuning if you can show them in, on the monitor right like this okay so before you start with your procedures you should first of all do a white balance here if you can get, show them the buttons over here over here so you press this button once okay and then with this button upside and downside to show the monitor you press it to the white balance and you just push it once and there is written white balance is okay, right? So you, you may proceed doing your procedure. Okay, hold it like this. This is basically a knob which you push in to start with the scope, okay? Now we will come to the encephalator. In encephalator, this is a switch on and switch off button. Okay, here you can see a start button and this is a stop button. So if you are going to start it, you just press it and it will get started. And you can hear a hissing voice. Give me the uh, this pipe. Uh, this is a connecting pipe where you, which you attach over here like this and the other end to the throw car once it is inside the abdomen like this. First, you do an anti-clockwise and then a clockwise maneuver, and it will get fed. And you open this, and you can hear a hissing voice. If there is any obstruction like this, the pressure will go up over here, okay? And it will give you an alarm as well. Here you see, the pressure is going up. And it, it's giving an alarm. It means there's some obstruction or the valve is off. So you will check it. The usual pressure we keep in the abdomen is 14 or 15 millimeters of mercury, and which should be less than 19 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Okay. And I'm stopping it. Here you can see the flow rate. You can start with a low rate, then you can shift it to the medium and then to high rate. Okay, and you set the flow rate up to 14 or 15 or 16. And this is the area which will show you how many, what is the flow rate in liters per minute? How many liters per minute is going inside the abdominal cavity? And what is the volume which it can be shown here, right? And I have told you if the tube is obstructed or if the valve is obstructed, these values will go up. And if during the surgery, if there is some cardiac problem or the anesthetist, he requests you, that uh, do not uh, have more pressure, then you can just reduce pressure like this up to 10, 9, 8, like this, okay? Okay? And you can increase it from here as well. So this is about the... And this is a switch on and switch off button, right? This is how to use it. But when you are starting it, there are some important things to do. And if you go back of this tower, we can see that there is an encephalator which is attached with the uh, cylinder which is attached with the encephalator. And you need a knob to open it and close it before and after the procedure. We have power supplies to all our encephalators, camera head, and the CCU. 
basic and the light source the basic issue is that we should be aware of these things as well that's why i am telling you at the end of the uh, presentation that you should know how to attach these right and if if we see that this um uh, is a system which is attached to the camera head and the other knob vga is attached to the uh, led then we have recording systems at the back and the outputs at the back and in the front as well i will tell you at the back here there is the s video out s video in and on the front side there is i will show you that there is a usb port for recording as well so we should know how to attach these and how to attach these with the uh, power supplies and they should all be attached to a good quality power supply unit at the back of the wall come on the front side if we see a little of this light source here you can see that it has got a switch on and off button here is a button to control the intensity of light a knob like thing and there is a port where you can insert the um, uh, light source cable in this is basically um, led light source but on the other hand there can be xenon light sources as well so this is a ccu or camera head unit this uh, has got a switch on and off button then this is basically uh the camera head um knob which is attached into the uh, in the into this socket and then we have a usb recording system as well and we attach any usb over here and we can record our system from you can show this from this button if you keep this button press for a while it will start recording okay you can see the record video here you can show them this will be okay right can you hear me sir can you hear me yes we can yeah i'm oh, sorry okay so you can have a recording button here and when you want to take a picture just click it once and it will be stopped right okay now at the end we will you know stop it like this and we will gently detach all the things so they can be secured so this is about the lap stack now i would like all of you to, to ask any question regarding the graspers regarding the ports regarding the uh, patient positioning or the lap stack uh dr amir khan can you hear me yeah doctor tanseer excellent presentation really and uh, also especially your patient positioning amazing this is a new concept in my opinion and good orientation for youngsters and viewers and um, so uh, now because we have uh, more than 30 participants on zoom from tanzania chapter Uh, Dr. Mohsen, or can you hear me, Dr. Mohsen? Yes, I can hear you, Ram. Sir, yes. sir, sir, if you have any question, welcome, sir. Uh, really, I don't have any particular question, uh, question but uh, I'm sure the the presentation was uh, excellent. But what I could say. Uh, on uh, instruments and uh, you know the the lab tech uh, and the and the and the and the positioning of the patient uh, uh, those are very this computer yes uh, so these are the some uh, so i will talk about this so we have ligature we have uh, different types of energy sources so safe journey versus safe surgery that is the most important if you are doing surgery so must be safe and so then invest a good uh, monopolar diathermy if you are taking monothermy because monopolar so again must be uh, so investment must be uh, for good instrument so you can see here 
this is the system in uh, monopolar or we can see electro surgery so we have active electrode we have uh, return pads patient is a part of circuit so that is the most important and because you all are general surgeon urologists gynae and you know about monopolar and this pad is very important because when this is the system and we have active and return and patient is part of circuit again the safety of patient is very important so then we will go advances in uh, electro surgery so this is uh, tissue response generator split return electrode pad active electrode monitoring voice command system that is also very helpful and argon plasma coagulation so we can see here uh, tissue sensing technology also we have and uh, so with this uh, we can uh, detect and now more easier and better results for us so if we see so factors modifying the tissue effect so current density versus tissue impedance so size of active electrode that is important cut or coagulation mode power setting duration of exposure tissue impedance so you know all better than me so we adjust this power this is 30 40 45 it depends on you but in laparoscopy this is not like open so little less and also the size of active electrode how much you take that tissue the small size will be more effective that is also some points some tricks then you are going to do this and again i uh, here so ohm's law if you remember so just i touch this one and if we see we also in energy source we follow this ohm's law also here in this uh, uh, so diagram i have tried my best to mention here so here you can see this power in impedance also 1000 2000 3000 and also output power in watts so you can see uh, so just imagine so this uh, power is very important and you must know about this and adjust this unfortunately uh, i uh, so i was witness in two cases uh, uh, so newborn for uh, uh, this circumcision and uh, i remember one time in when i was a student and one of the uh, so this uh, neonatologist uh, she was doing uh, this uh, circumcision in one day baby and just you can imagine what happened so because you don't control that power of cautery and completely so cautery that penis and finish within just one second so i never forget that and so be careful so when you are doing and you are cautery using cautery and especially in laparoscopy so adjust this power that is important and you must know about these instruments also regarding uh, your uh, also your nursing staff they must know how they must use where the the best part of the body they must use this pad and also you can see here return electrode uh, monitoring so you can see we have active and also we have uh, interrogation circuit so these points are important and when you are using just you can imagine here so in this diagram so these things you must when you will be oriented then there will be less chance of uh, complication or side effects so electrosurgical injuries during laparoscopy so we have three types mostly one insulation failure you know insulation so that grasper or uh, any instrument that are using it has a insulation cover so if any damage i will show you in uh, so if any damage so you don't know so because be careful always check your instruments so because when you reuse these instruments so there is chance of damage of this insulation layer and you can damage so you can also traumatize intestine bowel other parts of intra abdominal because you cannot see just you are working at specific point so be careful this point is very important and other is conductive coupling so this is also very important as well as capacitive so what will happen when you are so one thing that that is important when you are doing this cautery inside especially monopolar especially i am asking regarding monopolar you are using hook or something for dissection for lab coli just first 
touch the tissue then do this because if you will do so inside abdomen so this is not touching to the tissue there is more chance of this these issues like coupling so that is very important maybe you will damage small bowel at that time one thing and again so if you see when you are dissecting this uh, 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 during uh, this cholecystectomy so there are some adhesions between gallbladder and duodenum so also this dissection and always when you are using this monopolar or cautery inside so 30 seconds 30 seconds not for long time so when you will use more and more so this will also transfer you will not see because already there, there are some adhesions between this gallbladder and also duodenum and you will also damage gall this duodenum and you will not see this and you will miss so due to this so first of all when you are using this cautery inside abdomen monopolar so must use for some seconds and stop 30 seconds stop 30 seconds stop not for one two minutes so that that will be harmful for the patients these are the some points that be careful just you can see here i have mentioned so insulation failure what is insulation failure so if this is the insulation layer at your instrument if there is a damage so if you are doing working here this is your active electrode but so you if there is damage there is small bowel and you can also damage the small bowel here due to this failure so be careful always so these are the points you must be so you must check your instruments your nurse must be oriented because when you will reuse these instruments there is chance of damage of this layer so again we will see so there are yes some instruments if you have this that will be excellent so this is an insulinoscope you can check your instrument if any issue so daily basis you can check here after after uh, the sterilization you can check this yes there is no issue or before so it depends on you you can use your uh, this system and then you must control this because personally also I have faced some issues because if you will not oriented you will not check that yes there is chance of uh, so this damage and that is not then if patient will go you did just lab coli excellent job and patient will back with generalized peritonitis so that is a disaster also you will soon now we will talk about little uh, bipolar diathermy that is the also uh, again a great innovation by so this uh, uh, technique I can ask you and also very helpful uh, and also we can use especially in gynae patients and also personally I will share my experience just yesterday I did a lab coli that was a very difficult case mm -hmm. because about two months ago they did uh, cholecystostomy in another center uh, so because after in such a case we wait at least three months then adhesions will be less but unfortunately patient back with uh, this acute cholecystitis and urgent case so I did uh, difficult case I did lab coli and so then bleeding start from liver bed that was very aggressive and at that time so never panic so just I put some gauze there and wait and so again there was bleeding so in such a situation when you will use if the bleeding is from liver bed so this is my personal experience so then you can use bipolar diathermy excellent result never do dissect with ligature other things clips because you cannot clip that area you cannot put anything just with just hold I hold that with the gauze with my assistant and also with diathermy from one side bipolar so yes I can control and patient also I have discharged so these are the some points that so how and where you must use these instruments so diathermy especially in ovarian cyst also because this bipolar is good in ovary because we never use monopolar in ovarian cyst because we also save this ovary and there is less chance of damage for ovary so we have yes new bipolar devices and one of the most and my uh, especially I can ask you uh, personally I like Ligasure because uh, routinely with dice also there is this is a good dissector this is a very good uh, also I can ask so uh, healer and also dissection uh, so you can seal your vessels uh, especially when we do bariatric surgery and there is lot of uh, uh, adhesions and also we do uh, 
gastrolysis and also retrogastric area dissection we do this uh, uh, ligation of uh, short gastric uh, that is very important so ligature is excellent and uh, i love really ligature and uh, especially the this this ceiling especially this vascular system amazing results this is low voltage high current mechanical and thermal effect and also collagen elastic building and one thing that i must uh, ask you during this ceiling this is very important because again personally also i faced this issue about 6 7 years ago so when you are sealing the vessel no need more traction so if the this because especially when you are using this so this is the protein yes coagulation and then sealed so this vessel not be very traction yes especially short gastric especially that vessel there you think about this there chance of bleeding this must be relax not in tension then there will be more coagulation and when you will use this instrument especially ligature so grasp and you can put so this traction of vessel and then you, when you will use this instrument then there is more chance of bleeding so just relax and do this and confirm and then you can cut and if there is a risk of bleeding i use two or three steps so one second third and then in middle so i cut this so it depends on your experience and which part of the uh, body you are using this instrument it depends on you so we have different now now in the market yes we have this uh, plasma uh, trisector it's also good result personally i have no experience with this uh, instrument but overall yes in market it is available and also as uh, so uh, yes this is also an option for you and seal yes personally i have experience with this instrument it's also good and also like bipolar and also uh, also for dissection excellent also everything just like uh, uh, ligature uh, so you can also use this uh, instrument also we have esculap also i have uh, uh, experience of this this is also good and one thing that the rotation that is also excellent sometimes you need rotation so this is good you can rotate this angulate this rotation overall yes all our instruments have this point of uh, rotation but angulation also we have in esculap and it's excellent also you can dissect with this it depends on in different shapes you have and also you can use this one and also it has longer just just i put the, this picture of crocodile that you can imagine so this is a big jaw also here we have a longer jaw in this and then you can easily uh, take the tissue and you can coagulate uh, your tissue yes ultrasonic now we will talk about so that was bipolar first we talk about monopolar then bipolar some like bipolar we talk about ligature esculap we talk about and seal and now we will talk about ultrasonic devices i also like this harmonic amazing so for sharp dissection it's excellent and also the role of this this is not monopolar this is not bipolar this is ultrasonic so this has one fixed arm and one working so this fixed arm that you see this this is the movement and then uh, this point that you will take that uh, energy from this uh, arm that is a fixed arm so the, like this you can see harmonic scalpel so ultrasonic energy 55000 per second so the movement amazing it is and minimal instrument this is a dissector good dissector coagulates and cut so this uh, uh, reach till 100 degree centigrade so be careful that metallic arm or fixed arm is very hard so when you are out and be careful when you are used this so never touch to other like small bowl or other places so it will damage because still it is hot very hot you can you cannot touch your hand outside so it's very hard so be careful when you are using inside and just you can see and you can out so never put any instrument if there is no need to use especially these instruments especially harmonic because when you will use one arm is very hard must be out then you can do further if you want to do dissection or other procedure so just now you can imagine you can see that i see sharp dissection excellent i love uh, this harmonic especially when you're doing especially in endometriosis uh, routinely i use the 
dissection of uh, this hormone egg because you need pelvic dissection and also that all that area it's excellent and uh, you can do dissection yes this is the uh, sharp edge flat and also so power level is also one to five it depends on the space where you are going doing this surgery and again that tension and traction and tension that always uh, uh, earlier i have asked so when you are using this no need to pull more just yes need to pull but not very then you can cut that area and you can dissect that area then there will be less chance of bleeding so we also have sonocyan this is also same uh, but uh, with other name and uh, so we have harmonic uh, also this is uh, like ultrasound and it's also good i used sonocyan because sonocyan is wireless what is the difference between harmonic harmonic is attached with the device but sonocyan is wireless so you can use anywhere there is no need to uh, so also it will be charged there is a battery inside this sonocyan you can charge the battery and it is like harmonic and you can use this uh, so also yes uh, we can see hemostasis and dissection both but uh, in uh, harmonic so it's better to use for small vessels for hemostasis because if we compare with bipolar and harmonic this is the, my a personal opinion so at the end also i need comment from uh, professor amir khan or uh, any other uh, like uh, dr tanseer or they they can add their comments so my personal opinion so hemostasis is good with bipolar especially when the this vessel size is bigger so 7 mm in then personally i use i prefer especially in short gastrics i prefer ligature this is the good uh, so because this uh, harmonic is good dissector if we compare with the, uh, this ligature harmonic dissection is excellent dissection and speedy cutting but when we compare with hemostasis yes then we, you can see bipolar or this ligature is better it's my personal opinion but depends on the surgeon we have some hybrid devices also i remember in uh, last uh, this arab health uh, uh, there were some companies from uh, south korea and that was three in one that was amazing they have uh, so not i think till uh, four in one yes four in one so in same instrument they have Di in monopolar, bipolar, ligature and also harmonic in same small size. So hopefully soon we will see in market that was a good instrument. Yes, Thunderbeat as also I have used this. This is also a good instrument and also for dissection. Just you can see here this is the fixed arm. This is also like uh, uh, so uh, this uh, harmonic and this is this point is very important because this is hot area when you are using this if there is no need just out because it, you must see because there is chance of damage to especially small bowel or other intra abdominal organs energy devices so if you see uh, which is the best so just just it depends on you it depends on your unit and also depends on your surgeries which surgery are you doing easy to handle reliable efficient cost effective so these are the some points that you must especially for my tanzanian uh, participants and uh, tanzanian colleagues so when you are choosing your this is, uh, instrument so you must uh, uh, so this yes easy to handle reliable efficient and cost effective and so maximum vessel bust pressure also least thermal separate and least amount of smoke production that is also an issue during surgery especially in laparoscopy and fasted sealing time so it depends on you then you, then you can see difference you can talk with the companies so again it is a choice of the surgeon so which one because when you follow these features when you discuss because when you are going to buy some instrument energy source and you have these points that is effective yes it will be easy for you to choose your instrument so you make your choice it depends on you uh, so uh, which so all of these cars but uh, uh, so good running but it depends on you uh, which is good for you and make the right choice this is very important so because in earlier stages you can uh, talk with someone so you can take uh, uh, 
so you can ask so about which is good so now if you are uh, doing so only lab poly if you are going to do you know this uh, ovarian cyst appendectomy so just talk with another one and glr will guide you if you have any guidance we will be with you uh, regarding so for which surgery so we will we can share our experience regarding this any time we will be available so this was my uh, short and i try my best to uh, convey my message uh, sir please thank you thank you very much imran very well described thank you for the excellent presentation i understand you've gone through the basics of uh, cautery system uh, we all know from even from open surgery that cautery is very important and if you look around historic movies in the past even when people didn't have this electronic system they used to use uh, heated uh, iron uh, uh, bars to stop the bleeding so it's been a well recognized way of uh, uh, coagulating uh, uh, coagulation and stopping bleeding i think Im imran you made a very important point here that uh, it's important to familiarize yourself with the equipment and it is a surgeon's responsibility to make sure that insulation is right and it's the right type of equipment they're using in simple surgery or uh, uh, basic laparoscopic surgery most of the time you go to use electrocautery devices which will be monopolars or bipolars so i think try to make sure you you yourself familiar with it so you don't harm the patient because these devices are very good but if not if used not used properly or they've got a defect in them they can cause huge harm to the patients uh so i think uh, it's important to remember that part uh, especially when you're using uh, checking that when they put the pad on a patient it is dry it doesn't get soaked up because otherwise you can burn the skin in that area so i think uh, and then also if someone has got a pacemaker uh, imran the question to you is that if a patient has got a pacemaker uh, where you can't use monopolar diathermy what are your uh, choices and what precautions do you take sir in such a case i prefer ligashu yeah yeah bipolar is uh, yes yes and this is a very important point because we deal with such a cases and uh, be careful and we must know yes sir great uh any any questions from audience yes i have a question Please, Mosin. Yes, yes uh, Doctor Mosin. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Imran, for for the nice presentation. I think uh, Professor Khan uh, has summarized it very well. Uh, but my question is: uh, Is it? Uh, I uh, excuse me if my question is uh, is not uh, smart enough. Uh, a silly question. Uh, whether we also can use uh, laser energy in the laparoscopic uh, work, sir? You will answer. No, Imran, I'll leave it to you. I've got no experience of using laser in laparoscopic surgery, so I'm I'm not to be honest. I'm, I can't answer the question. Yeah, yeah, Doctor Mohsen, same. But uh, sometimes, sometimes we use in METs. that is not laser so especially when uh, user rf in uh, liver met sometime we use so we can see and just we put that uh, electrode inside that is not laser public asket laser uh, but routinely yes there is no role of laser in laparoscopy okay thank you sir this is the time of break uh, and uh, so after break uh, we will be back and erin is also ready so this is the time of uh, industry so i will share some videos uh, from industry i will try my best to share kumel can you help me
star size. But these risk factors depend on the BMI of the patient and the weight of the patient, because when the patient is very low BMI, uh, the weight of the patient is very low, then you can have a chance uh, to damage even abdominal aorta. So you have to insufflate the patient enough before putting in the trocars. And uh, other factors that can cause bleeding is the bleeding of the stapler sites or intra-abdominal parenchymal bleedings, which can be solved as Dr. Abbas showed with simple energy devices like a cautery, bipolar, or by uh, sonocision, sonographic devices, or RF devices. And there are always some simple tricks that you can manage your complications. In the left side, I have done this case uh, to a patient who was using warfarin, and we did a laparoscopic herniography. And you see that in, after the operation, we have a lot of bleeding. Even we got the patient off the warfarin seven days before. So in the elderly patients, even if you take off the anticoagulants, you might experience some uh, simple bleedings. So you have to be careful with these patients and in case you can give a vitamin K or TP or a TDP, free, fresh frozen plasmas to these patients to manage this. And various needles should always be inserted in a tilted way. Preferably I do it 75 degrees to, uh, or from the palmar region in revisional cases to escape aorta. But what we can do if we have a bleeding from the trocar side and we need some time or we have to finish the surgery, you, sometimes you cannot control the bleeding and you get nervous. So my idea, I, I have taken this from a literature from a Turkish surgeon and they prefer to put a folic, simple folic catheter into the port side and do a compression. It's the simple technique, simple method in laparotomic surgery. You can put a port side there, which is bleeding uh, aggressively uh, from maybe a branch from epigastric artery. You can put a folate catheter and stop the bleeding, finish the surgery, and then you can control it uh, open there, trochi side, and control the bleeding by cautery or by tie. And in laparoscopic surgery, we also use staplers for uh, doing anastomosis and uh, dissecting the tissues. So the formation, as you've seen in the advertisement, the B formation, the coming together of the staplers is very important. So when you are doing advanced laparoscopy or maybe you are doing appendectomy with a stapler and then you have to use the uh, stapler uh, which is suitable for the tissue thickness. Like in the uh, stomach, we usually use green staplers at the antrum, so the tissue thickness is high. But when we are going through the fundus, we use blue staplers. Or in case of a vascular uh, portion, we use a white stapler because when we use a stapler height, which is too high for vascular uh, organs or vascular structures, then we cannot uh, ligate that structure and then bleeding can already happen. So when we have a bleeding, when we are uh, working up this patient, it will be very uh, easy to use an endoscope if you are familiar with that, or a colonoscope into the organ if you assume that it's an intra-abdominal bleeding. But to show that, you can use a simple nasogastric drainage. You can put a nasogastric tube when you assume that there's a bleeding from the inside the organ. You can aspirate it and see if the bleeding is interluminal or from outside structures. And when we are managing the bleeding, we have to go from the minimal invasive to the most invasive because usually these patients are deteriorated because of the bleeding and this is situation. So when you do a major operation on a patient who has bled, then you might have some uh, bad results. So in order to stop the bleeding, not losing time, you have to go with endoscopy, with resuscitation. And if you cannot clip the vessel or do the simple steps, then you can go to laparotomy without losing time and manage the patient. This is a teamwork with your anesthesiologist actually. 
And in this course, usually you will do as a junior surgeon, a cholecystectomy or an appendectomy by starting laparoscopic visceral surgery. So these are the injuries to the bile duct, which can happen in your lifetime as a surgeon uh, who is doing cholecystectomies. I have uh, experienced some of them. So these, we use algorithm to classify some of the complications in surgery. And this is uh, also Bismuth Strasberg classification uh, for uh, bile duct injuries after cholecystectomy. But there are many reasons for these to happen. It's mostly a lot of traction, not using the uh, right instrument, right coagulation instrument, or keeping the pressure very low uh, when you're doing uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy or your assistant would, should not, maybe not very experienced on uh, camera holding or uh, helping you from the uh, left side of the patient. So this is a classification. Every surgeon has to know that if they are doing laparoscopy. And from type A to type E, it's getting more complex. And as you can see on the figures, type A is an injury from the uh, a small uh, bile duct leak from the liver bed uh, in continuity with common hepatic cystic or Lushka ducts, but it's a small injury from liver bed. And when we go to type B, it's the partial occlusion of the biliary tree and the unilateral canal is almost always the result of an aberrant right hepatic duct. And type C is drain conduit in communication with common hepatic duct. As you can see, there's a conduit. And also it can be due to a uh, aberrant right hepatic duct. So you have to know about anatomic variations when you are doing a cholecystectomy. And if you need intraoperative help, you have to ask for a senior if you have it, when you see something strange. And type D is uh, lateral injury uh, of the, uh, it can be because of a cholecystectomy during the operation because of a cannulation but you can easily damage the uh, common hepatic duct laterally and then it becomes a type D and type E is the circumferential lesions of the major bile ducts. So as it goes to type E, it's more difficult to manage by less invasive techniques. So this is the basics of this classification. So when we have a bleed tree injury, how can we uh, work up or see if this patient has a complication? What are the signs? So the early signs are the jaundice, biliary drain output, and the patient becomes septic, nausea, vomiting, and peritoneal irritation on physical examination, especially on the epigastric and right upper quadrant area. And when we look at the late onset, we see patient can develop cholangitis and secondary biliary cirrhosis in some of the cases when there's a stricture, uh, but no leak. And the sonography is very uh, helpful on these cases to show the dilatation of the biliary tree and intraperitoneal col collections mm -hmm. and can guide the treatment of the patient by percutaneal drainage if you have a radiology department that can do so. And the CT is also important uh, to show the biliary duct by if you give an intravenous, uh, intravenous uh, material to see the uh, hepatic ducts or uh, transhepatic cholangiography also will show the dilated hepatic ducts, uh, but it's more invasive. Nowadays, we use MRCP, an MR technique, which shows the whole biliary tree and it can show also the collections. And then it can give you an idea how to uh, treat this patient in which way, minimal invasive or with laparotomy. And ERCP is a life savior because in most of the lateral injuries of the common hepatic ducts and uh, type, type A and B injuries, we reduce the pressure by stenting uh, uh, the papilla or by uh, doing sphincterotomy and uh, then wait and see when the pressure is lower, it will also close. So in this publication, uh, they have made an algorithm for bile duct injuries. My colleagues will show you a standard cholecystectomy and you will see how it has been done. Most of these injuries happen 
in the case of a, uh, acute cholecystitis, in the case of uh, complex cases, or sometimes, as I mentioned, because of the technical abnormalities, you have to, you have to follow a standard uh, cholecystectomy procedure. But when we, when we intraoperatively diagnose uh, that even you put a clip or you have uh, caused an injury to the biliary tract, then you can manage it intraoperatively actually, but it depends on your experience. So if it's an A-type injury and from the liver bait, you can ligate or clip that aberrant uh, hepatic duct and then it can be resolved. If it's a type D injury, a lateral injury to the common hepatic duct, then sometimes a little primary suture and drain or T tubing might be necessary according to the size. But you can manage it also even laparoscopically or laparotopy by laparotomy, but intraoperatively. But when it uh, goes to complete injury of the hepatic, uh, common hepatic duct, it goes more complex. Then you have to do a biliodigestive anastomosis, like a, a cholecogeginostomy or hepaticogeginostomy, depending on the stump of. Uh, common hepatic duct that is there or depending on the side of the injury. So you might not be able to do it at the same session. So when you realize it post-operatively, everything seems fine, there is no bile leak, but after the operation, you experience cholangitis or uh, bile coming from the drain. And I prefer the juniors to put a drain to every cholestectomy case until they become very experienced. So if you have a drain, then you don't have to put a drain again if you have a bile leak and you can realize early if there's a leak or not. It's not just for bleeding, it's just a backup for you. And then you have to do it later in the post-operative diagnosis period. So there might be a stenosis in the cases on the right side when it is very close to the uh, portal confluence that there, there's a great chance that this, even if it's repaired, there is a stenosis. So you might need to stent that by e ERCP, or you have to repair it. Maybe after six weeks after draining the patient, saving the patient's life from sepsis. And then you have to make even a hepatic resection to see the site of the injury, if it's on the right, on the left, or on the confluence. So even it can go to liver transplantation in some cases where you cannot manage to repair and the patient becomes cirrhotic and then everything goes worse. So uh, in this publication here, it's more betterly shown according to the Strasbourg classification, how they managed, how they work up the patient, the injuries and here, as I told you before, this is a very good classification. Here you see A, is cystic duct leaks or leaks from small ducts in the liver bed, you see. And B is the occlusion part of the biliary tree. And there is always a right hepatic duct injury most of the time. And C is the transaction without ligation of the aberrant right hepatic duct. You see C here is total transaction, it's not occlusion. And D is the lateral injuries to the common hepatic ducts. I saw a lot of these uh, with junior surgeons because they realized that it's a cystic duct, but then, it, then they realized that it's a common hepatic duct and they injure it. And E, e is the circumferential lesions where you have to check for enough stump to manage the patient in common hepatic duct. So how they manage it? Here you can see that in uh, some of the patients, uh, they have managed it intraoperatively. They, they put a primary suture like in E1, there's a circumferential lesion, but they see it and they do it intraoperatively because it's easier. You don't have edema or tissue necrosis or any adhesions when you do it on that time. So in the D on the lateral, also you can put a drain some, I prefer most of the time like the total uh, circumferential lesions like E1 uh, to put a T-tube, but in that case, they didn't do it. And then they, you can put a primary suture if it's a, a lateral leak. And if it's a big circumferential lesion, 
then you have to do a laparotomy and preparation of the liver and do a bleach digestive anastomosis. And in some cases, you can use the ERCP stents and lower the pressure on the colodoc because like in every digestive surgery, we have to lower the pressure to uh, leave it to secondary healing. But then stenosis can also happen in the later phases. So you have to be careful when you do an digestive anastomosis or leave it to secondary treatment. You have to be uh, wise to see the stenosis and manage it. Otherwise, the patients can become uh, cirrhotic even five years after cholecystectomies. So I will show you a very complex video that we do an ERCP procedure on a patient with gastric bypass. It can be done also, but this is an intraoperative ERCP procedure. So this was just to show you the uh, sphincterotomy in this patient. But because the patient had a gastric bypass, you have to be careful. You cannot go in through from the oral route. So this is with Dr. Dilamans where I worked for one year. And then we, we opened the antrum in this case and we put a purse string. With laparoscopy, you can do amazing things. You don't have to open up the patient most of the time because you have the camera, you see it on your side, 20 times bigger than the normal. So you can do most of the operations laparoscopy. In that case, we, we have put a trocar inside, inside the remnant stomach, and then we can reach uh, the duodenum and the papilla, and then sphincterotomy can be done and the bile stones can be taken out by that way. So you can have these kind of patients when the patient has a total gastrectomy also, because then you won't be able to get into the uh, Wedding by the normal route. So this is not only for uh, bariatric patients, but you can sometimes use this route for patients with subtotal gastrectomies or patients uh, where you cannot reach uh, the duodenum uh, directly. So this is an intraoperative ERCP procedure. So this is a hybrid way. This is how laparoscopy can be uh, used in conjunction with endoscopy. So after we, they canalize, uh, they canalize the papilla, then they will do a, here the gastroenterologists do that, but in my country, surgeons can also do ERCP procedures. You can canalize the papilla and cut it. Here you see, they, they, they cut the sphincter and then the bar started coming in and even you can put a stent afterwards if there is a stricture there or there is an injury to the biliary tract and then you close the, uh, by simply pulling on the strings, you close the stomach and that is it. And the patient's problem is solved without a major laparotomy. And the bleeding, gastrointestinal bleedings are common after uh, hollow viscous surgery. This is maybe not an appendectomy. You can do a gastrectomy and or you can do a bariatric surgery and then you can experience bleeding from the stapler sides. This is an algorithm given after gastric bypass, but it is almost the same. When you have an intraduminal bleeding, you have to resuscitate the patient first and, and, and you should stop all the anticoagulants and then you have to check for intraluminal bleeding, if it's intraluminal or not, by endoscopy. And if it's a mild, moderate bleeding, you can do it with conservative management, giving patients some fresh frozen plasma and banked blood. But it's a persistent bleeding. You can check with gastroscopy. You can look at the anastomosis. If it's a bleeding from anastomosis, you can give do a cyclera therapy by giving epinephrine at that side or putting simple clips to any vascular structures which are oozing or bleeding. Or if it's not an anastomotic bleeding, you have to check for other bleeding sites because it can be a bleeding from an ulcer from another uh, viscous organ. So you have to be careful on that. And leaks, 
what what can we do if a leak happens? It can happen from dinostomosis, or it can happen from a damage to an uh, to a small bowel when we are introducing the trocars or when we are manipulating. So we have to be careful for tachycardia, fever, and severe abdominal pain after laparoscopy. Like shoulder pain is common, but this should not be uh, the reason of all the laparoscopic procedures. So if the patient is in severe pain, then you have to be uh, thinking if there, should, there can be a leak and you have to check the CRP uh, and uh, whole blood sampling of the patient, CBC, and look if the acute phases are rising rapidly. And you have to always make a uh, ultrasound or a tomography if you are suspecting that. So early leaks can be managed at the same day if, if you suspect if it's coming from to a drain, bile, or intestinal content, then you can repair it on the same day depending on the abdomen. But if the abdomen is worse and the time passed, like two days, three days, then you can have, uh, like in this case, there was a perforation of the colon. You can, you can make a colostomy or ileostomy depending on the leak uh, site to save the patient. Or if it's a, a upper GI procedure, you can use endoscopic methods as I'll show you now. But you have to improve the patient's condition uh, at the same time before doing anything. You have to feed the patient if you will take the patient to OR later. You have to check the blood cases. You have to give support to this patient and take it to ICU if it's necessary. Uh, and I will talk about some simple procedures also. Uh, what, we, what the juniors are doing are the appendectomy, laparoscopic appendectomy. And it's a very simple, good procedure because you can see the whole abdomen by visualizing. But there can be some adverse events like port infections. Port infections, especially in countries where the laparoscopic equipments are using used more than once. There can be a port infection, and it can be due to the appendicolitis uh, that leaked into the port side because no glow or endobag has been used. But it can be treated by simple drainage and antibiotics most of the time. But sometimes it can become complex and can cause fasciitis. Then you have to drain and do a, a surgical check of the port side. And there can be also hematoma at that side if the patient is experiencing a lot of pain. So you have to drain all the time and check it with ultrasound before because there can be also some hernias uh, at the pore side. Here you can see that we are using an endo loop most of the time or a clip uh, to ligate the appendicitis and close the uh, stump. But sometimes these loops can rupture also and you, you have to put a, a suture on that side. So you have to be careful and you have to choose your trocar sites wisely when you are doing a laparoscopic appendectomy because there can, the, bladder, the bladder can be over distended. You have to put, I always recommend juniors to put a Foley catheter. Then you can take it out after the operation when you are, you are doing laparoscopic appendectomy. And uh, it should be a little bit lower than the underwear line, but not too low, not on the suprapubic line, but a little bit, two centimeters above that, the port uh, on the uh, midline. And you have to be careful when, you're, when you get in, you have to be uh, careful with the major epigastric, inferior epigastric vessels. And you, you should not cut that when you're, even when you're opening the taut fascia. And you have to be careful when you're tracting and when you are handling the appendicitis because you can always damage the cecum and you can come up with a leak. And uh, leaks after appendectomy are not common, but it can happen if you have a more advanced case, which is going to a plastron appendicitis or a perforated appendicitis. Then if you have a leak, you should always drain it and you can use in the advanced leaks a tube checostomy if it's needed. You can uh, control the leak, or uh, you might need a uh, ileostomy, but it is usually not most of the time necessary.
but bowel obstructions can happen after appendectomy because of strictures, because of uh, breeds, mostly breeds, and they usually happen in perforated or gangrenous appendicitis, and they give the symptoms four to five days later, most of the times with uh, bowel obstruction. So if you have a case with prolonged bowel obstruction, you should always take a rectal, oral, and IV contrast CT scans to see if there is an abscess or leak and then manage it accordingly. And uh, as I said, uh, injury to major vessels are sometimes common if you don't handle the laparoscopic equipments or the tractions wisely. And what, and how we can use endoscopy to manage leaks? Sometimes we have complex leaks in that picture like on the duodenum and what we can do to this, we have to save the patient first. We have to feed the patient and then think about it. And after the patient is stabilized, we can use an endoscopic clip, stitch, and, uh, or a stent in order to block that side of the leak. But we have, we have to always improve the patient's life and realize where the leak is. And I do a lot of also bariatric surgery. Maybe in your country, it has just started or it, or it has been done. So in some of the cases, you can have uh, bowel obstructions after uh, bariatric surgery, like a band in this case, or a strictures caused by uh, anastomosis, or there can be leaks caused by uh, sleeve gastrectomy or other procedures. So when, when the patient comes to you with leaks, first of all, you have to check uh, when this leak has happened. And you have to confirm the leak with uh, a simple upper GI series or CT. So, uh, and you have to reach the leak based on uh, if there's an abscess or it's a small leak or it can be managed conservatively by just drainage or uh, if it's an acute leak, you may even uh, go in laparoscopically and stitch the leak or do an amantoplasty but you have to decide on the patient's uh, condition. If the patient is severe in the ICU, then I would prefer you to do simple measures like drainage, stamping, and endoscopy. And if it's an early leak, you can use laparoscopy in that case. And there are lots of new treatment modalities uh, for the leaks now. It can be a stand or even an endovac. Now we can use this vax that which the plastic surgeons are using inside the organs by introducing with a nasogastric tube. You can put it onto the advanced acute or chronic leak site, and then you can uh, use this technique to create a granulation tissue on that site. I just wanna show it to you as a new method. And uh, you, you should be like a detective. In this case, this is our uh, patient with a leak after mini gastric bypass. And on the uh, five hours after surgery, we see bile coming from the drain. And this was because of us. We have uh, damaged the jejunum uh, by the stapler when we are doing the anastomosis, but we have realized it very early. And then we went in and we repaired the leak of the patient. But the thing is the patient has started to develop even at that moment, uh, intra-abdominal uh, adhesions and sepsis, but the patient's life is saved because it was early realized. So the, the drains are sometimes very important to show the situation in that time. So as juniors, I recommend you to use simple drains for a few days, not more than a few days, just to see the condition, the bleeding or the leak. I will just uh, just show you some pictures, not too much. These are too much advanced techniques, but when you have an anastomosis in bariatric, in oncologic surgery, if the patient comes with you vomiting or uh, not feeding enough and losing weight, it can be because of an anastomotic stricture. So by using an endoscopy, it's easy to see these strictures and to dilate them by using an endoscopy. So if they are uh, 
lower than one and a five centimeters and the endoscope cannot go through the these anastomosis, then you have to dilate this and you don't have to operate the patient again. These are all the needs. I will show you a simple dilation procedure uh, after plastic bypass, or it can be even after an oncology procedure on erzipagus. So we use these balloons nowadays. If we experience a stricture after bariatric surgery, you see how stricted is that part. It's even, I think, lower than one centimeter. So by using endoscopic techniques, you can manage the patient's complication uh, easily without reoperating the patient. So I prefer to call uh, minimal invasive endoscopic surgery these procedures. These are hybrid procedures. If you cannot do it with a the balloon, then you can go and redo the anastomosis, but you have to try the endoscopy all the time. And then you can save the patient's life by just dilating the anastomosis in three, four session, and that will be enough for the patient. I will just, just show you this one, how advanced sometimes the patient's condition can be after laparoscopic surgery and complications. This is a case that I got from Dr. Galveaneto from Brazil, and you see that after gastric bypass, this guy has a leak, and the, you would see that it has an open abdomen and in the ICU setting. And you can see the endoscope inside from the leak side. It's such a huge desensed de 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 uh, anastomotic side where you can see even the endoscope, but they would be able to manage even this leak by endoscopy. Uh, so you, we have options. We don't have to go to laparotomy all the time. And in this case, in this patient, you can do a, you cannot do a laparotomy because then you will kill the patient because of the adhesions and open abdomen and the whole viscous should be all stick together and you cannot separate the enteral ansus, enteral uh, tissue in that case. You have to be uh, finding a new new situation where you have to use less invasive techniques. This is how you can see a patient and you have to manage it uh, other than laparoscopy. Here you see how the fistula can become uh, an enteral, uh, enteral fistula and uh, the abdomen is open and these are all mechanical things. So these are staplers and you have to use these staplers wisely, but even if a leak happens, you have to know how to manage it, how to know the algorithm to do that. If you know the scientific methodology, the algorithm, then it is, you will be a successful surgeon because then you will uh, use all these techniques to save the patient's life. There is not only one technique uh, to manage complications. So you have to know also about the literature and the ways to do that. Here you see the endoscope is out and there is a leak side, it's too big, more than two centimeters, I guess, in this patient. And they then they put a stand and they, they started, started feeding the patient and they stitched the stand to this side so the stand cannot go down. And the stent is an internal stent. So from inside, the patient can start oral feeding because oral feeding is very important to uh, create the intestinal environment, microbiota, and to give enough calories and nutrition to the patient to give them a chance to heal their tissues in the secondary phase. So it's not only the technique, it is the multidisciplinary approach where you can save the patient's life, improve the patient's condition, when there's a big complication afterwards. So you have to also depend on, on your strengths when you're dealing with complications. You cannot do everything by a surgeon by yourself. So you have to have a big team, anesthesiologist, gastroenterologist, which are also should be trained in order to do complex cases. So these is uh, and the 99 of the complications, 99% of the 
complications can be prevented by adequately preparing the patient, choosing the right technique and the uh, right intraoperative strategies. And treatment of complications require high expertise and surgeon always be open to help from more seniors and other clinical specialties. And choosing the effective, starting from less invasive methods and following salvage strategies will improve the patient conditions and save the patient's lives. Also, these decisions should be taken in early time frame. No time should be wasted and patients should be transferred to a more advanced institution in case of any inadequacy of the center or the surgeon. But the primary point is not to harm the patient. And I'm still the president of Young If So. And if you want to join our group, please just sign on Facebook, Young If So page, and join. It's a, about all bariatric surgery, but it's open for junior surgeons. There are lots of uh, fellowship and also educational opportunities on that too. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, opportunity for sharing my ideas with you. Uh, Aaron, excellent presentation, really, like always, and very informative. Uh, thanks a lot. Sir Amir Khan? Thank you very much. Sir Amir Khan, have you any question? Overall, excellent, Aaron. Really excellent, and you have covered all perspective. And also, it is a good message for our youngsters. So, mm -hmm. if they are going to do laparoscopy, so they must know about complications, and they also must know how they deal with complication because this is a teamwork. So, laparoscopic surgery is not you cannot go, you cannot do solo flight. So, you must be with the team. And the role of MDT, this uh, multidisciplinary team in all laparoscopic surgeries, especially in advanced surgery, is very important. And excellent presentation, and we appreciate really always uh, your support, and you always encourage us. Thanks Thank a lot. You Thank you. And now, due to shortage of time, we will uh, go ahead, and now we will be. Uh, yes. Okay, now? Yeah, better. Please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So, now we start our presentation and this is laparoscopic. Uh, Manzar, again, your voice is not clear. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, but voice is not clear. Okay. Just a moment. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, much yeah. better. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And sorry for inconvenience. Uh, but the topic today is laparoscopic appendectomy. Can you see the slides? Yeah, we can. We, we can yeah. see the slides. Yes. Just okay. okay. Yeah. Just click. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now, at the end of this short presentation of about 20 minutes, hopefully the audience will be able to know about the appendicitis patient presentation. We already know, we will only review it shortly, not in detail. Workup and diagnosis, history of appendicitis, how it started and how it uh, reached to the laparoscopic procedure. And what are the advantages of laparoscopic appendicitis over the open conventional procedure and uh, indications of appendicitis? Indications for laparoscopic and operating room setup. I think so. The actual presentation starts from the operating room setup and position of the patient and instruments used, and what are the ports, where are the ports placed on the patient. 
and uh, procedure steps. I will describe the procedure steps in a short way, then I will demonstrate it by a video. And uh, what are the possible complications in post operative care? And there will be a short video of four five minutes. So, inside this, uh, it's an uh, inflammation of the appendix to uh, blockage of its human. It causes a infection caused by, caused by blockage of appendix from fecal infection or lymphoid hyperplasia. Inflammation compromises blood flow to appendix that may lead to tissue death uh, and venous appendix erupts. Erupts will cause bowel content to spill into the abdominal pelvic cavity, peritonitis, which is occasionally fatal. And it's not treated in a to septicemia. Because rupture occurs within 10 to 2 hours of onset appendicitis, it usually uh, presents uh, when it is patient the emergency, it should be updated within 24 hours or 48 hours. So, a uh, short review of the signs and symptoms. The patient usually presents with the pain in the center of the abdomen and this that usually shifts to the right leg for some. With time, pain increases in intensity and sharpness. Pain migrates to lower uh, quadrant, that is called neck burning point. Uh, it is usually associated with nausea, vomiting, and reduced appetite. Constipation and diarrhea may be a variable feature. So when you examine the patient, uh, there is tenderness in the right leg fossa, and rebound tenderness has a significant importance. In, and temperature, usually low grade temperature, if, if it's initial appendicitis. If it's a rupture, then may lead to a high grade temperature. Workup is very short for the diagnosis of appendicitis. Uh, if it's clear, then we can have a TLC count and w, uh, complete blood picture. It is usually raised. Complete urine examination is usually not required for appendicitis, but rule out UTI, urinary tract infections. Ultrasound is usually sufficient to diagnose appendix or rule out the uh, differential diagnosis. In some centers, uh, if there is facility available, it is kind of superior to the ultrasound. Physical examination, along with a few medications, are sufficient to diagnose appendicitis. The history of appendicectomy is very interesting. So, first recorded removal of uh, appendix was in 1735 by Claudius Simon during hernia operation. American doctor Thomas Morton performed the first appendicectomy for appendicular appendicitis successfully in 1887. So, from 1887, the first appendicectomy was done. Unpredictable course of appendicitis led to Charles Burney in 1889, two, of, two years after the addition, to advocate early appendicular interference for suspect acute appendicitis. So, at the end of uh, the 18th century, the appendicitis was uh, uh, labeled as a disease which needs a surgical intervention. So, but when we uh, talk about laparoscopy, the first performed laparoscopic procedure was in German gynecologist for Sam in 1981. So advantages, uh, advantages of laparoscopy and sectomy and laparoscopy, some are general advantages, some are specific. General advantages, less post-operative ideas, and, and as compared to open. Because when we talk about the internal obstruction, so all the books say for first, uh, first uh, most common cause is previous surgery. So when you say previous surgery, it's written in the belly and love the textbook of surgery. Uh, the adhesion uh, appendicectomy is the most common procedure that leads to post operative adhesions, and that patient may present as an instruction later on. So, when we talk about laparoscopic appendicectomy, it causes adhesion but less as compared to open. So, lesser chances of post operative adhesions and instruction is a very important advantage over the open because the conventional are both uh, surgeons who don't know laparoscopic appendicectomy can usually uh, talk against this procedure. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, they should talk about because the data has proven the intestinal obstruction and ideas is a significant risk factor that is reduced after laparoscopic appendicectomy. Lesser chances of incisional hernia as compared to open because of the short incisions. Uh, no right in one hernia. There's an interesting uh, post-operative uh, advantage because when we do open appendicectomy, there is a nerve injury. That causes the weakness of that sided inguinal muscles that may lead to later on inguinal hernia. Although the chance is not so significant, but there is chance to develop inguinal hernia after open appendicectomy. That is, redu uh, uh, after laparoscopic, there is no chance because there is no incision in the right leg first. So, short hospital stay is a general advantage over the uh, open surgery, fast recovery time, it's a general advantage, less post operative pain. Fewer post-operative complications as compared to open. 
and minimal scarring. So, advantages of lepros of and chutney are significant over the open So, uh, common indications, indication is generally observed at the site. In some cases, when diagnosis is not clear, then laparoscopy has a uh, very good advantage over the open appendix because open appendix means we cannot see whole of the When we do uh, for suspected uh, appendicitis pain uh, or uh, pain right leg for uh, generalized abdominal pain, so we can see whole of the through the small holes. Patients who suspect acute appendicitis are candidates for the appropriate approach as compared to open approach. The Contraindication that when we talk about the contraindications, there are no absolute contraindications. It all depends upon the uh, surgeon who is doing the appendicectomy. If it's a senior surgeon or uh, a trained surgeon, there is no absolute contraindication. But yes, generally, for most of the uh, leagues who are junior or in the learning, or excessive peritoneal deviance, uh, uh, it, it is a relative contraindication. And second is any ability to tolerate pneumothorax. So it's not a, a, a contraindication of the it's a contraindication of laparoscopy overall, like cardiac patients who are cardiac output less than normal. So we, we cannot we should not do for laparoscopy. So when we talk about the port position or uh, patient position, this is a very important. If the uh, procedure starts from the head, patient should lie flat on the abdomen, and uh, surgeon should stand on the left side of the uh, patient. And the first camera system depends upon how, how you uh, place the port. So camera system may be on the right side or maybe on the left side of the surgeon. But on the patient, the uh, camera system should be on the left side. The screen, quality, monitor, color section, they should be on the right side of the patient. So uh, IV line should be on the right side of the patient. There should not no IV line on the left side of the patient because the left arm should be by the side of the patient. So the cameraman or surgeon should not be uh, feel any resistance. So this is the port position, this is the placement of the patient and surgeon and assistant. The first assistant should be on the left side and first and second assistant should be on the right side of the patient. So instruments, there are no special instruments required except the bowel gas for our eight metric gas. It's a matter of because we have to deal with the uh, ACOM and small gut, and so there should, there should be no uh, traumatic reaction because it may cause the perforation, which uh, uh, the surgeon may not know at the time of surgery, and patient may uh, late on present at the time. Right? So be careful uh, when you choose the instruments while doing the uh, bowel handling. It should be a traumatic reaction. A traumatic reaction should be truly a traumatic uh, experts are uh, low quality companies. They say it's a trauma, but we have experience uh, that they are because of trauma or serious illness. So it's a fully traumatic, they are the complete thing. Endo Caesar, Asexual, Endo GIA. Endo GIA is sometimes are endo look like it. It's a personal choice of the surgeon or the available resources. In some rich countries, I have seen the senior surgeons, they use uh, sepsis. But uh, in our countries, like uh, in our region, we use uh, uh, switching routing by a white surgeon because it's a cost effective and uh, equally good if you know the how to do routing. Exception tube and bag for the removal of the appendix as uh, it's uh, 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 unable to remove from the port side. Otherwise, uh, we can remove usually 90% of the cases and pull them too far without touching the wound. Because if you are interested in the wound while well, removing it, it may cause the uh, late on port side infection. Zero degree scope is sufficient, uh, it's available. Otherwise, 30 degree is also a good option. Three tokar is sufficient, uh, one camera tokar and two other working ports. So, electroparticles ports uh, depends upon the, how much uh, resources you have. Uh, otherwise, monopolar, bipolar diathermy are sufficient. If, it's better if you have like a sure. Uh, uh, harmonic devices, but uh, if you don't have still bipolar diathermy and monopolar diathermy can uh, work in laparoscopic appendicectomy. If you know, if you if you want know how to use these uh, devices, uh, because uh, bipolar diathermy has a different mechanism, as Dr. Imran Abbas uh, shortly presented, and monopolar diathermy has different. So, electrocardiogram devices, whatever you available, you should know how to use it. 
Laptoscopic printing should be port side. This is the port side is a variable. I have seen at least two different ways. Even different in different ways. Even just books or printed in different ways. So I am telling you here how I use and uh, how it's an easy procedure. Uh, umbilical port is for the camera port. It is usually tenable. Uh, so you can use 5 mm if if your uh, telescope is 5 mm. Otherwise, usually 10 mm telescope is used and I'm like this. Uh, is used for the camera. The right upper quadrant port for the right hand of the surgeon and left lower quadrant port for the left hand of the surgeon. Because uh, uh, if, if we talk about uh, angles of manipulation, which are the basic rules of uh, any laparoscopic surgery, the two instruments should work at the uh, angle of 60 degree when they are working in the common. So this is the, uh, uh, this should be a port position if you want to work. Uh, it at a good angle, as an easy angle, without any swarding. Otherwise, some people uh, use one one port uh, between the pubic symphysis and umbilicus, and the port just above the pubic symphysis. It can also be used, but it causes swarding of the instruments during surgery, and handling and movement is not as easy as as shown in my port position. So, I'm like port, right upper quadrant port, and left lower quadrant port. This is the uh, port position of my eyes and many books are going to prove. Laparoscopic procedure overview. Ports placed at right upper quadrant of light and left lower quadrant region, as I just uh, shown in the previous uh, slide. Instead of the cavity, first you place the uh, local and uh, local area junction. Because uh, you are doing laparoscopy and uh, you uh, you are at the advantage that you can see all the abdominal cavity and rule out the other. Uh, possibilities are incidental findings uh, easily. So inspect the whole abdominal cavity, reflect bowel to expose appendix. Uh, believe you me, when you start with a particular appendix, you will not like open appendix because uh, seeing and uh, 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 finding the appendix is easy. Because I, 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 we have experience in you know, open procedures. Uh, sometimes we, uh, we don't feel easy and that is more in the and in TN. Still, it's difficult. But in the uh, Whole abdomen is open to you for the small hole. Separate meso appendix to locate appendicular artery. You can divide appendix and appendicular artery, separate appendix uh, either to the stroper or to the back. Irrigate thoroughly if it's in that case that there is flow free through the irrigate and the uh, final inspection of the abdominal cavity for any bleeding or any infection or any other incidental finding. So, this is a procedure overview. Port placement 10 mm trocar is placed with umbilicus, abdominal cavity, integrated to a pressure of 15 mm generally for a, a, a adult, uh, but depends upon the whom, to whom you are dealing with. If it's a kid, you can, if it's a child, you can place uh, low interfacial pressure, depending upon the size of the belly. And uh, if it's a cardiac patient or a compromised patient, you could also put pressure low to, decree, uh, to avoid any anesthesia for, uh, problem or blood pressure problem. Camera is also inserted to the large port, a 5 mm port inserted in right upper quadrant, the second 5 mm port in left lower quadrant, as we mentioned previously. Inspect the abdominal cavity. The area is inspected to orient the surgeon to the position of appendix. Inspection will also alert surgeon to uh, any anatomic variation or pathological conditions that may be relevant. Because appendix position uh, variable, it may be infosacral, it may be it may be pre ileal post ileal even uh, we have seen the appendix uh, just below the liver, some hepatic positions. So, if you have a, uh, doing the open appendix, uh, some hepatic appendicitis uh, to, to find the appendix is less difficult. But you are, if you are doing laparoscopically, you can find it easily. Expose the appendix, uh, 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 appendix the bowel is gently resected closely using eight pomade adjustment. To allow access to the appendix. Locate and separate the appendicular artery. The meso appendix is separated from the body of appendix and meso appendix side is separated to reveal the appendicular artery, which is coagulated, clipped, or tight. Uh, it all depends upon your choice. If you have a good energy device like, like a shore or a moon, you can like it easy. But uh, if you uh, want to clip and make a window between the base of the appendix and become, and you can clip it. Otherwise, uh, Bipolar diathermy, you can you know, bipolar uh, coagulate it with the bipolar diathermy for a few seconds and then touch it with a scissor or uh, hook, uh, hook uh, monopolar coagulation. So, when appendix is free, then you can tighten the piece. 
derived appendix from the cecum is using insulin by nurse. Uh, you can place uh, extracorporeal nerve. Uh, you can place intracorporeal nerve. So it all depends upon your skill. Uh, you can place a pre tied nerve with company available in the loops. Two loops are placed proximal uh, towards the cecum, base of the appendix, and third loop is placed one to two centimeters distal to the base from the the appendix is divided between the two proximal and distal loop using phaser or cortex. Samples may also be substituted for loops. And uh, available sources are good, then you can use a uh, blue color structure for the And that, that, uh, that's not expensive. I think so. Uh, we are doing levels of We should master the knotting skills. That will help in many other uh, surgeries. Uh, irrigate the abdominal cavity should be irrigated through with uh, line and suction. Uh, uh, remember, when you irrigate, suction is subject to the issue. The yeah. final inspection of the abdominal and pelvic cavities are inspected one final time for any sign of infection, error, or other potential complications of which the surgeon might be aware of. This, this can often be done simultaneously with irrigation because when you are handling, Avoid any idiogenic in the cecum or abdominal ileum. So inspect it carefully when you are ending the procedure. Complications are a of appendix during the procedure while handling. If you are not gentle uh, or your gastro is not asymmetric, you may rupture it because otherwise not uh, rupture previously. Uh, that may cause local infection in the abdominal abscess. Adherence is a complication of uh, surgery, but its uh, adherence uh, percentage is less as compared. Outside infection, it's a preventable infection. If you use the bag uh, or the fuel of the organ or uh, removing the appendix to the trocar carefully, uh, not touching the outside. Post operative care hospital stay usually 24 hours is sufficient. Sometimes this uh, is a uh, post operative IES. Patient may need a little longer stay up to two hours or up to two hours. Patient can walk around with up to 12 hours, antibiotics, and pain management. And patient can remove and resume normal activities within one week. And thank you so much. And after this, uh, I, I will have a, a short video. Can you see, Doctor Mran? We can see you are uh, Mandar. We can see your slides, but not video. Okay, let me just. just. For an excellent uh, presentation, little there was an issue in sound. So next time uh, you can see that, I think. Okay. Uh, now can you can see it, video? Yeah, yeah. You can start. Well, this, is a, this is a short video of laparoscopic uh, appendectomy uh, for the demonstration. So after putting the camera uh, inspection of the abdominal cavity, first is the first step. As we mentioned, after putting the camera, we inspect the abdominal cavity. And, uh, and now look at uh, during the append laparoscopic appendix. How easy to find the appendix? Usually, sometimes you have to do a dissection if it's a cecum, but still, if it's easy, it's easy than the open. So this is a meso appendix, and uh, if there is any free fluid, we can take it. And uh, look at the grasper. There should be a comment there when handling the gut, ileum or cecum. This is cecum. We can follow the tinea coli to find the appendix if it's not uh, uh, visible on first inspection. This is general inspection of the abdominal cavity. Inspection of the proximal two, three feet for any metal javelticulum like things. Are any stickers? 
any other incidental inflammatory If you are good expert in using monopolar uh, hook, uh, uh, hook is a very uh, good instrument for dissection in many places. During laparoscopic pregnancy, uh, handling the appendix, you should be gentle to avoid any during surgery. So you can make a window, you can apply a pair, but if, if you are fair, a pair for that, it can cause bleeding. Otherwise, a monopolar diathermy is good enough. But after making a window between the visual appendix and base of the appendix, you can apply it. This is a simple stitching at the base of the appendix. So, social anatomy skill is an essential skill if you want to uh, have, uh, proceed for the further procedures. And it's a very basic skill. And uh, I recommend every any that social anatomy skill to be mastered. I hope so. Uh, GLR forum is a very good forum for the researchers. They will arrange some workshops for the social networking for the residents and surgeons who want to learn this skill. But once you know the social networking skills, horizon will be open or you can perform any surgery. So this is a step. You can apply a pair uh, over the node. Uh, it's also safe. Previously, it was told that the clip should not be applied. But no, uh, many such people favor that clip. Uh, uh, applying clip at the base is also safe. But applying only clip without knotting, it can be risky. So don't take this apply knot, and you can uh, apply a clip over it. Provide second knot. So it's a general general inspection of the uh, pelvis. For any other incident findings or Dr. Manzar, excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzar. Uh, yeah, yeah. There is, a, uh, there is a, another small, very small surgery that is made by which we want to show the uh, residents that uh, you can hear my voice. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, there was a morbidly obese patient having 60 BMI and uh, presented. Uh, with vague abdominal pain. Even CT scan uh, could not help uh, properly. Uh, what is the matter? But there was a suspicion that patient has appendicitis. So uh, it was referred by uh, uh, my colleagues for laparoscopy. You can look at the advantages. Uh, how, how laparoscopy helps this patient. And uh, literally, appendix was found very long. And so uh, just below the liver. So just believe if you have started it uh, as an open procedure, how 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 um, you would be not home if it's not a laparoscopic procedure. You can see it. You yeah. Can see the, uh, yeah, yeah, we can see now. It's a very short clip, uh, but not properly recorded, just mobile view. Uh, but, but you can appreciate the uh, finding. Now hold on. Yeah, we can see excellent. Fantastic. Oh, 
how will you manage this architecture if it's not developed? So, thank you so much. Uh, any question? Uh, welcome. Dr. Manzar, excellent presentation, especially this, uh, your last video that is excellent. And also we can see the role of laparoscope. So just now, can you imagine a patient with BMI 60, how you can evaluate inside abdomen with small incision at McBurney? That is very difficult till this is impossible with the small McBurney. And when the appendix is and appendicitis is still so you can see hepatic flexure, so it is much difficult. So, but with laparoscope, you can view all inside the intra-abdominal cavity and much easy also to rule out any other pathology. So maybe there is another issue. So excellent presentation. Uh, uh, my request from my viewers, uh, from, especially from Tanzania, if you have any question regarding lab appendectomy, Professor Manzar is here. Dr. Mohsen, and uh, if you have also any question from Tanzania, please, uh, Dr. Manzar is here. Manzar, while they're getting ready for questions, excellent presentation and uh, very good demonstration as well. Uh, so I think you, you explained it very nicely. Thank you very much. Just a quick question. You know where you put the ligger loop or you tied it, then why did you put a clip uh, proximal to that? So uh, it was actually to avoid the second loop. Uh, you can, uh, otherwise you can put the second loop. Uh, so avoiding the time and avoiding the uh, second loop, it, it was just put it for the second loop. Because I, I, I have a fear only, uh, uh, only on the clips, you cannot uh, be sure it will leak or it will not slip. So I, I, I usually put the knot and you apply a clip. Oh, that would be uh, for my own mind uh, okay. uh, The other question is that you did diathermize the end of the appendix. Why was what was the significance of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the data, uh, so that you can Just looking at, is there a question here? Uh, uh, I want to ask a question. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, go all the through measure appendix, and you didn't take it out. Uh, usually, I prefer to take the the fat out also because it might cause if it's not uh, nourished uh, some necrosis there. So, do you think should we take the fat out or not all the time? Yeah. Appendix. Miss Miss uh, Appendix. Yes. Appendix. Yes. No, yes, I... we, we usually don't take the Miss Appendix because it's a very difficult appendix. So uh, I have no choice mm -hmm. in uh, this. Maybe the I don't. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. I don't usually dissect like I put a like the I dissect a little bit. I put the suture and I take it out with the uh, fat. You know? Yes, Amazing. if you have, if you have a good energy device like uh, like I should harmonic, you can uh, easily go through it. Mm -hmm. Just uh, okay. uh, in our part of the country, Dr. Imran, Dr. Amir, Lou, we have to be a cost effective for the patient. We usually use less uh, uh, costly procedures, uh, make it easy uh, cost effective. So uh, using monopolar and going through that portion which you are saying that can be risky. So we usually use use a window and. Uh, Sometimes bipolar, sometimes monopolar. So why don't allergy devices because of a problem? Otherwise, you have a, a harmonic level should get in first phase. As you are saying, it's a very okay. good way if you have a good energy device. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Manzar, excellent, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so now the time, I think, uh, uh, Sarah Mir Khan. I think it's very good. I think it's you explained it very nicely. And uh, it sometimes can be technically difficult trying to find it. And you showed it so nicely that if you follow the tenures, you can always get to the base of the appendix. And uh, sometimes in some situations, you might have to do a retrograde dissection. You start from uh, 
uh, the, you can only see the base. So you dissect the base and then gradually move forward. Hint for the newcomers would be to make sure that you take the appendix out and not leave it behind, please. Because uh, it's, it's always worth, uh, worthwhile remembering that part. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Manzar. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, Professor Larry Akoko from uh, Tanzania, he's head of department of surgery, so he's also online. Sir, have you any question? Can you open your mic? Sir, Larry Akoko. Yeah, Sir, Larry Akoko, can you hear me? Hello, uh, yeah. Yeah, how are you? Uh, I, uh, I just talked to Larry Akoko about uh, 10 minutes ago. He was, he has been present all the time and he was hearing us all. I had a question with the microphone. I think Larry Akoko is also online. Hello. Hello. Yeah, how I are can you? Hear you now. I'm great. So, I was following through my computer. Unfortunately, I realized my mics are bad. No, now I'm on but the we cannot see you. We want to see you. Please open your video. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. okay. How are you, sir? Now you can see me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm great. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, so this Thank all you. is so, Dr. Mohsen. So this uh, really, so this all. The guidance and support of Dr. Mohsen and uh, so we have started this activity and Professor Amir Khan with the guidance of Professor Amir Khan. Professor Amir Khan is a pioneer of laparoscopic yeah. surgery in UK. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Larry is also head of department of surgery in Tanzania. Professor Amir Khan. Thank you very much. Very welcome board. We are actually looking forward. I'm yeah. seeing you now. So I think you've got a question as well. You've just typed it. So do you want to ask that question, please? Yeah. So I was just wondering, uh, three days ago, I was doing an open appendectomy. And it was badly hidden in the retro cecum going up to the ascending colon. Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering whether such an appendix that only comes out in pieces would yeah. be done laparoscopically. Yeah. Manzar? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. I think I think as we were saying earlier, the best approach for those ones is Larry, that you get the remember our OPA technique, start with the base of the appendix tie it off there and then gradually work your way around the rest of the appendix and keep on dissecting as you go up. And most of the time you can actually clear it. Uh, and uh, because uh, if it was all fallen apart and within that abscess, then you have to follow the standard technique of washing it and putting a drain there. Otherwise you should be able to do it uh, if you can safely. Yeah. Because you see even open the open appendicectomies, you only put your fingers in and it's the feel of the finger rather than anything else, isn't it? So in laparoscopic, <laughs> you can see it as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation. Welcome. Okay. Sir, I think, sir, I think we can go ahead. So yes. thanks, Manzar. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir Amir Khan, please over to you. Sir Amir Khan. Yeah. Is uh, Ibrahim around or not? Yeah, yeah, Ibrahim is online, sir. He's ready. Great. I think it gives me a great pleasure now to introduce our next uh, topic, which is again, uh, the main purpose of this whole course today was to have uh, discussion on basic laparoscopy procedures, as well as uh, also uh, look at the common uh, pro uh, procedures. I've got uh, lucky to have Ibrahim. It's good to see all of you again. Um, 
Jan, you want to share your slides? Uh, yeah, I'm just getting in there. Okay, guys. So as I said, uh, thanks again for this opportunity, and we'll be we'll be discussing uh, some of the issues uh, around. Um, just go back. We'll be discussing uh, a few of the issues around laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, because this is a basic course. So we'll try and uh, stick to a lot of the principles and the uh, techniques for all of you. And uh, we hope that you will enjoy this lecture. So uh, I hope that you don't look at this presentation in isolation. We have two previous master classes that have alluded to uh, issues around laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The first was our GLR basics of laparoscopy course. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Amir Khan all already mentioned, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy masterclasses. So please uh, make reference to that as well. Now, before we undertake surgery, always uh, good to uh, know why you're doing surgery. And I think uh, uh, these are the common uh, indications for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the first being uh, biliary colic, uh, second and, and arguably the most common is cholecystitis, whether it's acute or chronic cholecystitis. And then the third is uh, complications from uh, gallstones, uh, for example, cholecystitis, gallbladder empyema, uh, gallstone pancreatitis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And fourth, we have incidentally diagnosed uh, stones. It's uh, my uh, inclination uh, whenever stones are diagnosed, even if it's incidentally or not, uh, for us to do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, especially if you have good laparoscopic. Uh, skills and you have good results with the operation. Uh, it is, uh, as I mentioned, my inclination to have them removed. And you'll find that in, even in those patients who it is incidentally diagnosed, the histology almost always shows uh, cholecystitis. So in terms of our uh, preparation, uh, the position of the surgeon and the assistant is important. I generally stand on the uh, left side of the patient and the assistant stands uh, behind and to the left of me. Uh, you can also have two assistants if necessary in a difficult gallbladder or a, or a very large patient and the second assistant can stand on the right hand side. Ergonomics are important. Uh, make sure that the table is uh, almost at your elbow height your uh, eyesight is in the line of the uh, monitor and uh, you are sort of looking in the gallbladder direction uh, on the right uh, top area of the patient is where your monitor should be. You should make sure that you check all your equipment, instruments and consumables uh, prior to, con to commencing the operation. I think all of you will agree that the most frustrating thing is to start a an operation and find that you lacking consumables or one of the instruments don't work, etc. And it just wastes waste time in theater uh, whilst the patient is under general anesthetic. Uh, patient positioning, we usually have the patient in a supine position. Once all the uh, port positions are in, we elevate the head of the bed and tilt the uh, bed towards uh, myself, which is towards the left. That means the right side up. Um, access techniques, make sure you know all of them. Uh, all the th surgeons will have one technique that they prefer uh, over the others, but uh, all patients are different and all abdominal walls are different. And it's important for you to have many access techniques in your armamentarium. And uh, lastly, establishing pneumoperitoneum. I generally have it at about 15. Uh, but uh, you can start low, you can start at eight and then work your way up. Uh, generally in patients with a high BMI, sometimes you may have to uh, increase the pressure a little bit just to make working place for yourself, uh, but just keep in close contact with the anesthetists and watch your airway pressures and your blood pressures, etc. 
So this is a basic port position. Uh, as you can see at the top left hand side on, on the left side of the middle line uh, is, uh, is the port that I generally put my clip applicator through and remove the gallbladder from as well. On the right hand side of the patient, you'll see two five millimeter uh, incisions. Uh, the most lateral one, and at the umbilicus, you can see that he's got a little bit of a longer incision there. This patient had a uh, had a gallbladder issue, but concomitantly had an umbilical hernia. So what we did in this patient was we removed the gallbladder through the umbilical port, and we just did a tissue repair for him uh, on the way out uh, before conclusion of the operation. Uh, this is the type of patients we've been seeing during the COVID era. If you look closely to the right side of the umbilicus, you will notice many uh, scars there from, uh, from uh, recurrent uh, injection with anticoagulation. And this patient was a recent uh, COVID survivor who came back uh, with uh, problems of cholecystitis. So it's important for one to appreciate what uh, the um, critical view of safety is, and this has clearly been described, it's one of the measures that we utilize to stay safe and avoid uh, major bile duct injuries in laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And this is essentially the view that we like to see at uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, where you see two structures and two structures only entering the gallbladder. One is the cystic duct shown here in green and the cystic artery. And you'll see that the instrument goes behind the two structures, uh, which is your pos posterior window. And it's important for you to not only see these structures, but to make sure that nothing is adherent at the back, back of the of the two structures. This bit of anatomy is important as well. As, as well. Uh, we refer to Callow's triangle and the hepatocystic triangle, and uh, it is important for you to establish uh, these triangles uh, during the surgery so that one stays away from the other major structures. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the techniques to stay safe during a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Ruvia sulcus is another landmark that I use uh, quite frequently in my operating. Uh, and you'll find that in those patients who have quite severe cholecystitis, the callus triangle is difficult to dissect and your ruvia sulcus will help you to just stay high uh, with your dissection. So in terms of uh, securing the... Uh, uh, in terms of... Uh, in terms of securing the cystic um, uh, duct and artery, you can you can suture it. Uh, you can use uh, clips in that area. There is also clipless uh, cholecystectomies described in the literature, which uh, we stay away away from as much as possible, especially for beginners. So I'm going to show you a case of uh, gallbladder empyema. We showed this case at our last. Uh, Master concentrate more on the on the uh, landmarks and the, some of the steps during operation, and you have the treat of uh, having to see a complicated case as well. So the first issue when getting into the abdomen is find the gallbladder. And although that may seem like a silly statement, in a in a difficult case like this, you can see that the gall gallbladder is very difficult to view uh, ab initio. That means right at the beginning of the case. So the first thing to do is identify the edge of the liver. And if anything adherent, try, in this case, you'll see a whole lot of omentum is adherent and you'll see some exudate around. Try gently to separate this area so that the gallbladder comes into view. I'll let the video run and I'll talk you through the main steps during this operation. So here we can see the gallbladder is coming into view and uh, we can see to the top left of our screen, the uh, Maryland is uh, the, the back part of the Maryland was used uh, for a little bit of uh, traction and on, on the liver so that we can open up the space and, and find the gallbladder. Uh, it's very difficult to elevate this area initially because you have a very distended gallbladder and uh, it's difficult to grasp. So because it's difficult to grasp, the trick at this point is to continue as much as your dissection gently 
and with blunt dissection as possible until such time that you can at least see uh, much of the gallbladder. Once you can see the gallbladder uh, clearly and you know that none of the surrounding structures are adherent to it, for example, the duodenum or the stomach, etc., then you can uh, put an aspiration needle in and you can decompress the gallbladder. Once the gallbladder decompresses, it'll be easier to grasp and it'll be easier to lift the liver and the gallbladder. That step will then help you to take you down slowly to the Kellos triangle. I think an important point uh, during dissection is to be uh, quite cognizant, cognizant of the, of the uh, uh, pressure on your instruments. If you find that two structures are densely adherent, do not force the issue. You will cause hydrogenic injury. Go to another area of dissection, try and make headway in that area, and you find wood time uh, the area that you were struggling with will then be easier to dissect. So if areas are separating easily, you can continue. If, if they are not separating easily, go to somewhere where it's easier and continue to make progress during the operation. With, with very inflamed tissues, uh, you will find that uh, sometimes the, the, the uh, different structures become difficult to visualize and uh, don't hesitate to irrigate the area. The, the key thing is to make sure that we have good visibility at all times and uh, you can wash the area down, wash the blood away so that you can see exactly where you're going. There's somebody's mic who's on. Uh, can you mute it? We're getting quite a bit of interference. Yeah, he's, he's muted his mic now. Carry on, please. Thank you, Prof Khan. So here we can see uh, the, the, all the movements are now geared to try and separate the gallbladder uh, completely away from the omentum. And if you look at, at, at what we can see now relative to when we started the operation, you will find that at least you can see more of the gallbladder and you can see the, you can see the cholecystitis, uh, you can see how friable the tissues are and uh, you can see the fluid in the tissues. And these are all features of an infected gallbladder. And as I mentioned already, this is a case of, an, of a gallbladder empyema. Stay close to the gallbladder. You can see here, we're trying to stay close to the gallbladder and we're trying to gently push everything away uh, just so that we can slowly work our way down to the Kellos triangle. So as you can see from, from the commencement of the operation, it was difficult to visualize the gallbladder. The first thing that we did was to try and find the top of the gallbladder. Uh, once the top of the gallbladder was free, then we started to work around the gallbladder. So we started on the sides, we started on the anterior aspect uh, between the gallbladder and the omentum and on the lateral aspects. Uh, and if you, if you progressively continue with that, as you can see, slowly we are now mobilizing the gallbladder and it is starting to come free. Without completely mobilizing the gallbladder, it is extremely difficult, almost impossible to then go and find 
the cystic duct and the cystic artery and dissect Kellogg's triangle. So this part of the of the operation is extremely important uh, to make place for yourself, separate the gallbladder, and it gives you the best chance of having to, to dissect the uh, important areas. Okay, hey guys, whenever you're doing uh, this part of the operation, always make sure that the aspiration needle comes in under view of your camera. Do not blindly uh, insert the aspiration needle. And uh, also, it's not only to decompress the gallbladder so that you get traction on it, but if it's a case of a gallbladder empyema or you think the, the, the bile is infected, we send some of the bile or the pus away for uh, microbiology and uh, suck as much as you can out, not only to get traction, but decompress the gallbladder as nicely as you possibly can. And this will help you in case you uh, enter the gallbladder later on, it will also help you to, to contain the, the sepsis from the gallbladder. You can see nicely here that the gallbladder is decompressing and uh, we're hoping to now be able to get a, a, a grasp onto this. One of the other things that you can do is uh, to put a suture through the uh, fundus of the gallbladder and apply traction on that. Uh, but uh, I think there's an easier way. And if you just decompress and if you use a traumatic grasper as we shown there, should be fine. So use your landmarks. Uh, uh, once we um, decompress the gallbladder, we were able to elevate it and most of the dissection anteriorly and laterally was done. And we're now starting to work our way uh, in the, in the um, uh, Hartman's area and near where we expect to find the cystic duct and the cystic artery. In a case like this, it's very difficult. The, uh, the normal textbook demonstration, and as we've shown you pictorially in the, in, in the uh, initial slides of the nice cystic duct and cystic artery, going into the gallbladder is actually a luxury. In a lot of the cases that we do, we find that the gallbladders are so bad uh, that identifying those two structures easily, and we'll show it in this case as well, uh, is very, very difficult. And if you, um, if you are hoping to find that critical view of your cystic duct and your cystic artery, and uh, you're not aware of your various landmarks, and as to uh, uh, staying high with your dissection, you can get into serious trouble in a case like this. So as you can see here, we, we're sticking onto the gallbladder gently with the back of the instrument, trying to push things downward. We're not digging uh, down in the, uh, in the area where the common bile duct is. Uh, we're staying high. And when things start to make sense, uh, then we can start going for those structures. can see a global view here, quite a messy gallbladder, uh, you know, uh, full of pus and, and uh, you can see how infected uh, this whole area is. I made the uh, um, mention previously of how uh, I use the suction. We use it for suction, we use it for irrigation and we gently use it because it's a blunt up instrument uh, to gently tease away the the, the tissues. Uh, remember, even with this instrument, you can cause iatrogenic trauma. So don't don't push too uh, wildly in an uncontrolled fashion. Uh, as I'm doing here, gently pushing at the tissues so that a lot of the exudative tissue and the and the inflammatory tissue moves away, and we can start to see some semblance of a gallbladder.
Now, this, this area of the dissection was quite uh, hazardous. Uh, we assumed, and you can see from the exudate in the surrounding tissues, looks like a, a local area of perforation. And uh, you can see here that all the uh, pus uh, mixed with bile is oozing in this area. So the suction comes in handy because as a pus oozes out, uh, you suck it up and you dissect also with the same instrument and you can irrigate simultaneously as well. So when you end up with a picture like this, one of the, the moves is to, is to try and identify your Hartman's pouch of the gallbladder. Try and identify where the Hartman's pouch will be before trying to find the cystic duct and the cystic artery. And generally that will take you uh, to where your cystic duct and your artery may be. So you can see as we're heading slowly down, we're keeping onto the gallbladder and we're slowly teasing the tissues away. This vascular structure at the front, we haven't cut yet. Uh, it's getting in our way a little bit, but we just want to see a little bit more before we know that it's safe to cut it. And I think that's one of the important things to mention. If you don't know what a structure is, don't cut it. Make room for yourself, make place for yourself, suction all of the free fluid, the, the blood, the pus, and then uh, when you're happy, you can clip it. So essentially what we're doing here is we think that this may be the cystic artery. We're not absolutely sure. Uh, maybe a prominent mesenteric vessel and you'll find that with neovascularization in a, in, a, in, a, in a case where there's a lot of inflammation, you'll find that there's a lot of vessels, uh, you know, getting into your way. But we can see it's nice freely dissected. This is going directly into the gallbladder and we're quite happy to clip it, get it out of our way so that we make more room for ourselves. In some cases of chronic cholecystitis, you will even struggle to find the cystic artery because it will be completely invested in all of the, in all of the uh, inflammatory tissue and, uh, and it will be hard to find. You may even just uh, cut it whilst you are dissection and may not even bleed because it's completely thrombosed off. So I've got a question mark, you would have seen that appear on the screen not too long ago. Is this really critical view? The answer is no. The, absolutely not. This is not critical view. But as I said, in a messy case like this, where the difficult is uh, dissection is very difficult, and um, and it's hard to identify your normal anatomy. Uh, if you can see it going directly into the gallbladder, stay high. Try and clip it and get it out of your way. But as I said, if you have any doubt, you rather call for help or not clip it at all. And we've mentioned already that in this part of the operation, if you just try and identify where is it that your Hartman's pouch can be, it'll help you to try and find where the cystic duct is. We can see some of the uh, capsule of the liver uh, is uh, damaged at the back. We're not too worried about it. Uh, that, that will regenerate and it will heal quite nicely. Uh, we actually expect this in, in this area because this was the area of, of what we assumed was the area of spontaneous perforation. And, and one of the things is when you see a picture like that, be gentle in that area. Don't go pushing in that area and don't get deep into the substance of the liver. Look at the uh, instrument where we pushing down with the back. We're not uh, pushing down with the tips of the of the instrument, and uh, gently pulling down uh, to try and give way, and and see exactly what's in this area. We assume at this point that all of this anterior bit is just inflammatory tissue. Nice retraction at the top opening this area nicely and we can start to see some uh, discernible structures going into the gallbladder. To look at this. I can look. If you don't run for sleep, you can look. <clears throat> Uh, Larry, would you mind just uh, muting yourself, please? Thanks.
guys so we haven't uh, we haven't clipped clipped the uh, cystic duct yet but we can see that there's just a little bit of tissue left to dissect now and uh, and we can see that it would be easier at this point to try and get around it. So we're trying to just clean out the front. We assume that the cystic duct may be in here, but this is really damaged anatomy. And uh, and uh, as I mentioned already, that in, in, in cases like this, it's sometimes a luxury to see these structures, but we're just trying to, to show you an example of how even in, in a difficult scenario, where your anatomy is difficult to uh, to discern, you can, if you're sticking to principles, uh, do the patient some service with safe dissection techniques. So here we're trying to, we can see that there's this remaining structure uh, at the front and uh, we now develop the posterior window to make sure that nothing's adherent to the structure. Uh, we kept nice and high with our dissection and, and this is the, the remaining structure going into the gallbladder. Very flimsy, very friable, but uh, the idea is to clip it and, uh, and, and release the gallbladder completely. When you're applying your clips, uh, also make sure it comes in under vision. We can see the other side of the instrument quite nicely. And uh, when you see the other side of the instrument, you can then with a clear mind apply your clips. Uh, sometimes in a very friable duct, if you apply too much of traction, the duct can tear. So just be gentle and uh, secure the duct as best as possible and your artery. Whenever you're applying your clips, make sure you see the other side. Uh, we generally use two clips at the bottom and one at the top. Sometimes you'll have a very short structure where the application of the top clip uh, then becomes difficult. Remember that side is coming out. So use the space to secure the uh, bottom and don't worry too much about the top. Uh, when in a case like this, you'll see I turn the instrument around. I always find it's easier. Uh, to turn the instrument around and place the uh, the top topmost clip. So yeah, our three uh, our two uh, two clips at the bottom and one at the top are applied, and we got a nice posterior window, and then we're happy to cut it. I think, uh, you know, whilst you're watching the video, the, the other thing that's important to mention is uh, the value of a good surgical assistant. And you can see in this case that the gallbladder is so nicely retracted. And certainly if you have poor help during surgery, it really makes it very uh, difficult and, uh, and frustrating to continue the operation. But uh, if you have good hands, we don't give them enough uh, credit when we're operating. Uh, I think certainly a good surgical assistant makes our life very much easier, especially when dealing with a difficult case. So guys, you can see we've kept our dissection high, completely separated the gallbladder. 
these structures uh, that we were looking for, your cystic artery and duct, if there was any appreciable structure going into the gallbladder and we were able to get a nice posterior window, we stayed high and uh, we clipped it if there was obvious entry into the gallbladder and uh, kept our dissection high, kept away from all of the, of the uh, dangerous structures at the bottom. And uh, most of, of our dissection is actually done here. And, 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 and now we will slowly start to separate the gallbladder from the, uh, from the liver. Uh, people always get a little bit um, uh, apathetic and let their guard down at this type of the operation, especially when the uh, cystic duct and the cystic artery has been clipped. Uh, but make sure that you remain vigilant right until the end of the, of the operation. It is important to keep a good plane uh, wherever possible between the liver and the gallbladder. Uh, here, because the tissues are quite inflamed, you will see that it separates uh, just with the pushing on it with the, uh, with the suction. Uh, but in a, a great deal of cases, you literally will have to chronic cholecystitis and chronic scarring and uh, the I don't enter the liver uh, it is important for you to stay on the gallbladder side if you enter, enter the gallbladder we're not too worried about that uh, you know we can always remove the spilled stones we can remove bile etc uh, but uh, getting into the gallbladder uh, risk a great deal of morbidity uh, for the patient <laughs> In, in uh, some cases as well, you will uh, see that the posterior wall of the gallbladder is densely, densely adherent to the liver. And no matter what you do, it just doesn't want to separate. And if you continue separating, you will cause more and more and more liver injury. So in cases like that, what you have to do is to then remove the anterior wall of the gallbladder, try and take much of the posterior wall out, and then you can then burn the inside of that posterior wall and you'll find that those cases will actually do well. That whole area will scar down after a while. So it is at, at this part of the operation, one uh, in addition to the, uh, the tips that I already mentioned to you when you're doing this dissection is be mindful of a Lushka duct. Not very common, but not very nice when you get caught out. So just keep your wits about yourself. Uh, be aware during this time of the operation. And it is as if this time of the operation that you will also prompt your, your scrubbed sister to ple say, please uh, have the drain ready, uh, you know, ensure that there is enough irrigation fluid left in the bag. And uh, also, if you're using any hemostatic agents, have them ready as well and keep your, your endo bag ready as well for the specimen removal. Certainly, in a case like this, you'd want to put the gallbladder into an endo bag to limit sepsis, limit port site infection, and just keep clean whilst removing the uh, specimen from the abdomen. So you can see everything is dissected here. This is just a little bit oozy uh, from the uh, gallbladder bed, but patient with the normal coagulation status, this should uh, heal quite nicely. Nothing, um, you know, uh, squirting here in, in terms of bleeding. A lot of the fluid there is fluid from the surrounding tissues and also a lot of the water that we irrigated with. So water, uh, use water liberally, suction in all your susceptible areas under the liver, under the uh, diaphragms, in your paracolic gutters, in your pelvis before concluding the operation. Here we can see we brought in a, a, a tonsil swab at the end just to do a final mop up before the specimen is removed. Uh, we irrigated well, we suctioned all the extra unnecessary fluid in the abdomen and, um, and uh, we placed a drain in the subhepatic space and this patient did extremely well. So at the uh, conclusion of surgery, um, 
let me just take you a little bit back here. So at the conclusion of surgery, as I mentioned, specimen uh, removal, if you have an endo bag, great, use it. Uh, if you can't, you can actually use a, you can take it straight out through the ports, but the site of port site infection goes up, especially in an infected case like this. Uh, sometimes you can spill stones, bile, pus into the abdomen, uh, which you don't want to do. Uh, and there's easier, cheaper ways. For example, if you use a glove, you can actually uh, put a suture or a loop uh, on the finger bits and use the hand, but as your, as your glove, you can uh, through where your hand goes in, you can actually put a purse string suture and you can make your own cheap uh, endo bag. Suction and irrigation uh, drain, I use it in selective cases, in cases in which the dissection was very difficult, okay. septic cases, uh, bleeding is important. Uh, uh, in infected cases like this, I tend not to use hemostatic agents. Sometimes it can uh, promote the inflammatory response and some uh, subhepatic uh, abscesses. Uh, but in other cases where I have a bit of ooze, I do uh, use, I'll show you an example now as well of using a hemostatic agent. Uh, make sure you check your port sites uh, and iatrogenic injury before conclusion of the operation. And make sure that you take your port sites out under vision. Uh, would you have no bleeding? But the moment your port can be my 10 millimeter ports, I routinely close to avoid a port site hernia. Final remarks. Uh, I think always uh, follow your principles. Uh, Sages has a good uh, um, safe cholecystectomy program online, which you can have a look. A few controversies before we conclude. Timing of surgery after cholecystitis controversial. I tend to uh, go in as soon as I possibly can for a cholecystectomy.